hear, you ever notice that the information that we're being fed doesn't always add up to the truth? Do you ever look out your window at night when the rain's falling down? Do you ever look down the street and wonder what is going on around you? Do you ever look out at night and ask yourself, is this all that I am? Where am I? What am I? Is this all there is? Is this real life? As technology continues to bring us closer together, it also tears us further apart. We watch the skies and look at the planet around us and its natural beauty as it continues to march forward on and on and on, unending, unceasing, unwavering. And yet our world, everything that we've built crumbles around us. We wonder, is this it? Is there more? There's got to be you. Yeah. We can search. We want to learn. We want to understand. We want to see all that we can see. Know that all that we can know. We want to look out there. We want to peek behind the veil. We want to ask the questions that nobody will answer. We want to light those fires, the sparks that ignite a curiosity in us. And we ask ourselves, what is out beyond all of that? Beyond the edge of reality. Good evening. It's Kaiser Pineapple. What's going on, chat? It is time, once again, for our next episode of The Edge of Reality. And we have a very, very special episode for you tonight. This is one that uh, we, we put some effort into putting together, and I am really having a good time getting this all set up. This is... Uh, Hope to be one of many in-depth, more maritime like types of uh, mysteries. Now, I'm not going to step on Jeff's uh, streams or anything, so just make FYI, he's got his thing. I'm covering more mysteries and that kind of thing, so I just want to make sure I make that clear. So it is a great pleasure, everybody. So I am going to go ahead and throw the usual banner on the bottom of the screen, and we are going to go around real quick. And we're going to just see who all's here. Say hi to everybody, and we'll get started. So first up, Gemini the Witch, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you here. Hey, Glitterfart, how you doing? Jude Curio, how you doing as well? And Linda in the house. How's it going, Linda? Good to see you. Good to see you. And at this point, I figure folks will kind of uh, start to filter in as they do, as usual. Let's say all the usual links and everything have been sent out, and everybody has been notified. So, all right. And I did see another one. Barbara Vance jumping in the chat. How you doing, Barbara? Always good to have you along for the ride. Folks, all right. So here's what I'm going to go ahead and do now that we've kind of gone around. As they, I figure more will uh, kind of pop in as they do. We're climbing up in the viewers. So let me go ahead. Folks, I have the supreme pleasure of introducing our guest for this evening. A wonderful gentleman, a good friend of mine, somebody who really opened my eyes to a lot of this uh, maritime mystery stuff that I really had only scratched the surface on. For quite a long time. This guy knows more about this than most people I know. And I know a few people in that in that industry. So let me go ahead and bring on our host for the night. Yeah, well, co-host for the night. My good friend, Grand Admiral Harlock. What is going on, buddy? Not a whole lot, my friend. How are you doing? And the wonderful people out there on YouTube. I say it looks like everybody is coming in hot. And we are having a good night. So... We've got uh, we've got quite a show for for everybody, don't we? We sure do. We've been planning this out for a while and talking about this for a while. I'm excited. Yeah, and uh, this is kind of your uh, your first foray into uh, the YouTube thing. So, cheers, it buddy. Certainly is. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, cheers. Hey. Uh. <laughs> Though my channel is is going to be slightly different. Um, uh, ultimately, my plan for mine is going to be covering. 
Uh, it's, it's interesting. My plan is to talk about history, but through the lens of both model building and model railroading. So dealing with railroading history and maritime history through kind of those model building lenses. So Very cool. Take for sure, but something I've wanted to do for a very long while. So, But I'm very excited to be a part of this and be able to kind of uh, contribute my... Uh, uh, years of slowly acquired maritime and naval related knowledge <laughs> and parse that out. I've, enc I've encountered a lot of unique maritime mysteries over the years that uh, have absolutely fascinated me and captured my imagination and I just couldn't help but diving deep into and learning as much as I could about. Yeah, and that's kind of a passion that we both share is model making and stuff like that. So it's it kind of... We we both clicked on that, and then you, you know you kind of drug me into all the maritime stuff, and I gotta admit it it was one of those I'd it's always kind of had a passing passing fascination, but to get somebody that actually has your level of expertise, I was like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> Jew Curio, welcome, Grand Denver Harlock, well met, pleasure, and glitter farts and models can make. <laughs> oh, come on, Glitter. <laughs> oh, funny. Let's see. Oh, the ri don't forget the wreck of the circus train in Illinois. Okay, there you go. <laughs> train wrecks are fascinating. They're absolutely fascinating. They're tragic, especially in the uh, 19th and early 20th century with wooden coaches. Hoo -hoo -hoo. But, uh, yeah, but yeah. like any train wreck, you can't look away. <laughs> no, you, you really can't. You, whew. Talk about Ashtabula. Woof. <laughs> oh, man. And looks like we got somebody else just joining in. Oksana Bonita. Hey, how you doing? All the fire. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so we are getting started here. So we have already got, uh, let's see, 14 folks here. And we are also live over on Rumble. So just FYI, I say if you guys don't mind, feel free, enjoy the show here on YouTube, but also feel free to go over there using the link over in my uh, pinned comment. There's my link tree. Definitely drop a like on the, uh, on the Rumble video as well. Want to make sure we're building up our uh, audience on both platforms and showing people that uh, we've got some fun stuff planned out ahead of us. All right, so there's that while I'm thinking about it because you never know when uh, Stevie or any of the others are going to drop into chat and start dropping rumbles on, as a grumble stuff on me. Let's go ahead and pop out my rumble chat so that way I can have both of them layered over here with the YouTube chat. Okay. Hashtag streamer life. <laughs> All right. There we go, and looks like we got something here. So, Jude Curio, hey Kaiser, uh, you can get in on the circus train wreck too. The area is haunted. Ooh, that'd be interesting. Hey, uh, if you want some haunted train wrecks, man, I can talk about a few haunted train wrecks and potentially haunted ones. I tell Very you what, cool. we're actually coming up here at the end of this month on the thirtieth. We're coming up on the anniversary of the uh, wreck of uh, Casey Jones and crashing uh, his express train. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, where was that? Mississippi. No? Well, it'll come to me in a few minutes. It's a little teeny yeah. tiny town in Mississippi. Uh, but, uh, yeah, terrible, terrible train wreck. Yep. Only he, well, I suppose it's not, it, it was terrible in the sense that he died, but no one else died. A few injuries, but only his death. So, all because he kept on that. Kept on that break the whole way up. Hmm. Now, there you go. Yeah. Uh, Mighty Meat saying, hey, babe, have a great stream. You too. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, we got uh, we got a lot of uh, really cool folks here. And wouldn't you know, Stevie's in the house. What's going on, Stevie? All right. And Barbara Vance, maritime disasters really get me. After perf, after four, ooh, friends being killed. Same with plane crashes, killing fam. 
Public transportation disasters affect so many. Yep. Now they do. And they and garner the a lot of attention. The more they can affect change, ultimately, uh, in policies, um, regulations. Um, honestly, had Titanic not happened, it ultimately would have happened to some other poor ship and some other poor crew and some other poor group of passengers. And, and who knows? Could have, Yeah, could have yeah, been even worse. Could have been even worse. Excuse me. But we'll get into that. Absolutely, we will. And folks, I'm just going to let you give, give you a quick little FYI. I am, I have got serious allergies right now because it is spring outside. And despite the best uh, Zyrtec and uh, <laughs> Flonase has to offer, I'm still just a little bit stuffy. So, FYI. <laughs> And All that's right. why they're here in the Midwest this time of the year. And well. yeah, Glitterfar mentions um, most rules only exist because something happens. It's That's very true. This is true. <laughs> pretty much the way it's always been. Uh, everything is very reactionary to whatever happens. Whether that be uh, a shipwreck or a train crash. That has yeah. also been known to affect change in policies. Yeah, Jeff... Jeff, one of our uh, good friends of the show, uh, Legal Vices, he does a regular show on Mondays called uh, Maritime Monday, and he covers a lot of very interesting, uh, like legal cases, but also disaster, like mar famous maritime disasters. And yeah, he has he does a really cool job getting all that information, digging it up, and nice. presenting it to everybody in the chat. So. This week, he covered the MV Dona Paz disaster. Well, that yeah. tells me it's a motor vessel. And my particular expertise, like, I want to point this out to everyone in the chat. I study maritime history in a very specific time frame. I, mean, uh, I specifically aim for late 15th century, mm -hmm. kind of the dawn of exploration, if you will, where you have the later developments of the Caravelle, the Carrack, and the... Um, uh, the Neo and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but I go from there all the way to immediately post Second World War. Um, so I kind of stopped studying maritime history post 1945. But I kind of feel like within that massive time arc, I, I there's a lot to study there. And so I kind of yeah. dive within that. But hearing that MV tells me it's a motor vessel. So that sounds yes. like a vessel of post. -40. Yeah. It was, yeah, it basically was a vessel. I think it was a former cargo ship that had changed hands. It was built originally in Japan, changed hands a bunch of times, and then ended up basically being repurposed as a passenger liner. And the original specifications for the ship said that uh, she was only to have a maximum occupancy of like 600-something. Mm -hmm. And the time of her disaster, she had over 2,000 souls on board that were on the manifest. Actual numbers from the disaster range upwards of 4,000 souls on board. Making it the deadliest maritime, like, maritime disaster ever. The only thing I can think of that might top that and i need to look up the number because quite frankly it's 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 a number i can't remember what it is what the number of deaths are but i i think it yeah. might actually be higher than that uh the wilhelm gustav mm -hmm. uh, which was a large cruise ship passenger liner built by the germans uh, in the late 1930s used for cruisers for the you know workers party uh, and it was full of refugees, of a bunch of civilians, basically, and the Soviets, without really knowing who was aboard it, bombed it uh, by aircraft, and unfortunately, nearly everyone perished. It immediately, like, caught fire, started sinking. Um, you know what? I am interested. Yeah, real quick there, um, I do want to go ahead and give a shout-out to Stevie. The Apostle Steve, recovering from COVID, lol, but I'm on the up. Stevie, we love you, buddy. Get to feeling better. Any, you know, we're we're all pulling for you. You know, <laughs> I know at this point it's, it, you know, it's a, just a nasty cold, but 
you know, get feeling better, bud. Ain't no fun no matter what. And real quick, so Barbara Vance asks, does our guest know about the Princess of the Stars disaster? Princess of the Stars disaster. Well, that might be one for us to uh, dip yeah, into. Yeah, that might actually, that, that might be a new one for me, and I love that. I, I find that all the time, that any time I talk about this, eventually someone comes out of the woodwork and points something out new to me. That's yep. how, over the last, really, when I, I found this fascinating when I was four years old, so uh, huh, many years now, 25 plus years, uh, I've not come across that one. But I'm fascinated. The Princess Star. I'm going to have to look that up now. Yeah, you might but want to I did make a want to share this with everyone because I, I was right. The death count was much higher. Um, so it is estimated that about 9,600 people died out of more than 10,600 on board the Wilhelm Gustav. Oof. So, yeah. Then I just remember that because that is, in my mind, the highest death count of any ship that has ever sunk, ever. Uh, That's up, up there, there as well as the paddle wheeler uh, sultana uh, yep. sank in 1865 right after the american civil war yeah jeff on. covered the uh sultana disaster uh he also did the east the one on the ss eastland, uh, eastland. and they did a video that with, we could talk um, about the, I, was, I was actually planning on mentioning that because yeah uh, that is as a consequence of the after effects of the titanic and uh yeah so the eastland and, and the regulations yeah, he did a video with uh, Ask a Mortician on that one. Ooh, okay, great. Yeah, she did a documentary. It was like 45 minutes long. Things. It was really well detailed. I mean, guys, I don't have any connection at all to Ask a Mortician or her channel, but uh, Caitlin Doty over at Ask a Mortician, she does an amazing job with a lot of her material. If you have not seen her video on the Eastland disaster, you need to do it. <laughs> I will say an, another really good one. Um, if anyone is familiar with it, I've been following him for a while. His channel is now called Part Time Explorer. He used to be part of the Titanic Honor and Glory group that was that had been working on a highly detailed, like perfect model, a three D model that's basically an interactive game, more or less, that you can walk around in every part of the ship. Yeah. Um, uh, he's since left that project, but he still does a lot of maritime history videos. And if you're interested in the Eastland, the Mary Celeste, he does a very good video as well. Ooh, um, that would yes. be, that's a fun one that's and, already and, and on I mean, my radar. He goes into the history of, of, what it, of, of, pre, of its previous life uh, when it was first constructed. It's, 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 it's interesting. Um, yeah, let me get this one real quick. So, Barbara Vance, our friends lost almost their entire family on the MV Princess of the Stars, owned by the same company as the Dona Pass the other day. Uh, motor vessel. So now I'm wondering if maybe I haven't heard of this because I, I tend not to go past the Okay. So yeah, I'm, I think it must have been a lot more recent. It was the same company as the Dona Pass, though. Okay. Ah, All right. here we are. Princess of the Stars launched March twenty seventh, nineteen eighty four. That's that's why I'm not very familiar with her, unfortunately. Yep. There were some motor vessels uh, that that were around in the Second World War that were built uh, in the nineteen thirties and you know forties, um, but beyond those, I'm I'm just not that familiar with ships beyond that. I mean, some of the big ones like the uh, the the United States, the ocean liner that's now unfortunately lying derelict. Uh, in yeah. Philadelphia there, but uh, beyond that, I I tend not to delve too much into it. I, I, aside from studying the lives of ships that existed prior to that point beyond then, uh, such as the Queen Mary, the Queen Elizabeth, um, Aquitania, uh, to a to short degree, limited as that was. Um, go ahead and, uh, let me go ahead and... Uh, is like welcome a couple of mo more guests. We've got Mexican Vader. How are we doing tonight? We are doing good, Mexican Vader. Good to see you. Tits and Ray, whoop, tits and Ray guns. Pineapple. Good to see you, buddy. Hope uh, hope you're enjoying some good brews over there where you're at. I'm just drinking Coke tonight, but uh, you know. And then Alex J, how you doing? Eh, yeah, don't worry, Barbara. It's cool. You know, <laughs> we, we've all got our areas. Say, so, honestly, I, f I find a lot of the, the stuff that he studies more like the steamers and the old old style of stuff. It, 
very fascinating because it's just a completely different mode of transportation compared really to what is. we know of today. It's completely different. Like studying the evolution of steam, both in the propulsion of land vehicles, locomotives, and in particular steam, uh, you know, ships, that is just endlessly fascinating to me. The fact that you can, I don't know, from an early age, the idea that you can boil water, produce this vapor, and close it in a confined space, you can move a piston, and then you can power things from that. You can turn a wheel, and then from there, you, from there, the, the sky's the limit. Yep. That is, that's really an interest. I mean, yeah, it, it, it just seems like, you know, wow, somebody had to really be working there, there you know, like to come up with it, but. Going from uh, the, the late 1700s, yeah. about the 1780s, all the way up until, well, really steam at its peak, Second World War, you know, and just after. I mean, heck, technically speaking, any nuclear powered carrier that we have is technically steam powered. Ship at the end yep. of the day. <laughs> all right. Well, let's go ahead. And we are about 20 minutes into this, and we're actually hitting our mark. So. Before we get into the actual meat of the uh, episode, everybody, uh, we got to do our usual thing in our usual way. So hit that like button or that thumbs up if you're on Rumble. Say so, uh, we've got uh, 18 viewers right now. Looks like eh, about 12 of you have done your job. So get on it <laughs> say we got to pump those numbers up those are rookie numbers <laughs> all right and i will try to uh keep the disruptions and whatnot to a minimum but you know we do try and have some good times and you know have a little fun with this but absolutely all right let's get in the is like into the show so let's get weird <laughs> So, we're going to go ahead and go back in time a little bit here. We're going to start out really where the whole genesis of this tragedy begins, which, strangely enough, was before the ship was even constructed. Is my uh, correct in that assumption? Uh, yeah, I really, this whole tragedy... Uh, almost seems like it was always meant to happen. Uh, the Titanic's construction uh, was begun in March of 1909 uh, and then progressed on from there. Now, what's important to know is, in addition to building the Titanic, the White Star Line was also building a, a sister ship that was actually started first, the Olympic. Uh, hence why Titanic is known as an Olympic-class ocean liner. Now, Olympic was built, was just a few months ahead of schedule, um, actually several months ahead of schedule, um, so much so that the Olympic was actually launched and had its maiden voyage in mid-1911. Uh, um, so they were actually able to kind of get Olympic underway and get some, some tests, some test information back on Olympic to see how it was performing. Yeah, Olympic was um, the test bed of the, uh, of the White Star Line, what was to come. Exactly. Of the, Olymp the Titanic, Britannic, and uh, I forget the last one. No, no, it was just those three. Oh, it was just three. No, it was just, okay. just those three. Um, it, it was basically planned as, to have a trio uh, okay. of, of liners that could be regularly functioning back and forth across the Atlantic. Um, now, having two was great, but uh, you know, having that third in there just in case something went wrong or to just be able to just profit that much more from the immigrant trade, which was absolutely enormous at this period. Hey, Sean D. Good to but see you. Titanic Thanks for joining in. Particular, in particular, almost seemed like it was predestined, if you will, uh, to encounter this kind of trouble. 
Um, now, there was a, a massive delay that happened while the ship was under construction. Uh, okay. In September, I believe it was, of 1911, uh, the Olympic was actually on one of her outbound voyages heading out of Southampton, uh, heading on its way to Queenstown, or I'm sorry, uh, across to Cherbourg, France, to pick up some additional passengers, much the same route that the Titanic would follow uh, nearly a year later. And the ultimate plan uh, was to, and ultimately, the Olympic, it's important to note, was under the command of a harbor pilot at the time. Um, Okay. So ultimately, it was, he was kind of in charge and getting the ship out into the open ocean uh, to where the captain would then be able to take over. Um, now, the Olympic being such a massive ship of, of just over 46,000 tons, uh, uh, it really needed to follow a specific path on the way out, as does most big ships. Yeah, There's only yeah. a certain area that are dredged, um, and in Olympic's case, it followed this complex S, and I kind of wish I had a, a map uh, that I could show you of the area. But essentially what happened is Olympic uh, curved around and was um, uh, there was a, a, a Royal Navy warship, a protected cruiser called the HMS Hawk, one of the Edgar class, and she was essentially coming in and they they basically ended up sailing parallel to one another <laughs> close call huh very close very close now the the hawk basically saw olympic heard its its two whistles a quick quick whistle blast indicating it was going to start a turn and watched as this giant ship started turning in front of it and they're like okay they're going on the path that we're going to go on so we'll just kind of come up parallel to this ship right <laughs> and th it's important to note that the disparage between these two ships the Olympic is this giant 46,000 ton liner. It's 882 feet, nine inches long. It is massive. And when something that large displaces that much water, it does create a certain amount of suction, a certain amount of pull given the void uh, of that displaced water as that ship passes by. And, and what yeah. happened was the Hawk, now either the helmsman, and that's the thing, is I'm to be honest, I'm not 100% sure if the helmsman was trying to execute the maneuver stern because that's what the people on the Titanic, the officers thought would happen. The hawk looked like it was suddenly coming astern and then half right astern and go in a different direction. Your uh, microphone kind of got a little bit wonky there, just FYI. Oh, I'm so sorry. There you uh, go. Now you're better? perfect. Wonderful. Um, I'm gonna so go ahead what and throw actually up. happened was the hawk, uh, it looked like the hawk was going to pass behind the Olympic from the officer's point of view on the Olympic. Uh, and ultimately what happened is slowly but surely the Hawk came into contact with the stern of the Olympic. And actually, I would like to, uh, actually, if you don't mind, I've got some photos I would like to show of this exact situation. Yeah, absolutely. I went ahead and uh, threw up a picture that I could find of the Olympic. That's, that's a good one. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, let's see here. RMS Olympic. And let me so go ahead and I do want to show this image. Uh, let's see here. This is actually because no one took a photo of the incident happening, uh, but someone did do a very good 3D rendering of the initial point of contact. And I will show that. Let's see here. Yeah, as soon as I see that there, I will go ahead and throw it up on the stream there we go there we go and there we are so here we can see the royal navy protected cruiser hawk coming in contact with that stern area of the olympic just below the aft well deck um and can you basically zoom in that what happened all? huh can you zoom in on that at all I certainly can, sorry. Make it a little bit bigger, yeah. There we go. There we go. Now, so uh, the Hawk, either through the helmsman intending to go astern or purely through the suction, and either way, the suction definitely started pulling the ship, being only about 7,000 tons displacement, towards the massive Olympic. The uh, the impact fortunately killed nobody because at the time the occupants were enjoying a lot of the public spaces. So 
that that was a fantastic uh, fantastic bit of news in this. And uh, fortunately, both ships made it safely back to port under their own power. The Olympic had to offload its passengers at Cowes, I believe, which was just nearby, okay. uh, before making her well to, uh, may, making her way back to Belfast uh, to Harlan and Wolf shipyards. Um, but the uh, the damage was not that substantial, and in fact, I do want to show a few other slides here. These are really neat colorized photos of the damage. Let's see. Oh yeah. And unfortunately I cannot zoom in on this that well, but uh if you got your con control button and your mouse wheel, you can usually kind of zoom in on it a little bit. For some Just... reason I can't, but okay. in no mind, I have others to go. <laughs> okay. go this oh, wow. is the inside there yeah and that is definitely what you don't want to see inside of your uh very pricey ocean liner well yeah and, and fortunately and I, and I think the area that it actually impacted if, if i remember correctly it was in third class i believe in that particular area um so it was already not not the nicest of tickets anyways um i'd have to double check to be 100 percent sure but uh, uh but anyways the damage was not that substantial it pierced a little bit above the waterline and a, bit, a little bit below the waterline and it flooded two watertight compartments uh, because it struck right near one of the bulkheads separating the two compartments so a little bit of flooding on both sides um and in fact i do have one other photo i want to show because it's, it's an interesting photo and it kind of shows what happens when a ship impacts another ship which is a photo that uh, you might see with a few other ships in this uh in this uh, video tonight uh, let's see here Okay. Apparently, I did not add that to my slides. Goodness, that's fine. Well, so from from this, I mean, so where where did so this end this, up leading to? Yeah. So from this damage, the Olympic has to be sent back to Harlan and Wolf, right? Well, at this point, the Titanic has been launched and is now in the Thompson Dry Dock. It's this, this huge uh, dry dock for specifically made for or refitted for these type of large nine hundred foot there about ocean liners to be able to fit inside of. Well, there's only one space, and the Titanic is in it right now. So they have to stop work on Titanic, pull Titanic out, and put the Olympic in. Now, here's the thing. Where that damage happened below the waterline damaged the Olympic starboard propeller shaft. So uh. if White Star was very keen on getting their brand new, currently biggest ocean liner back into service as fast as they possibly could. And so what they did was they took the, the uh, Titanic's propeller shaft, removed it, and placed it... And actually, at the time, I don't think it was yet installed, so I think that, if, if I remember correctly. Um, so it, they just placed it instead inside of the Olympic uh, in order hmm. to get the Olympic back in operation. And I think within... I think it was about two or three weeks, something like that. Harlan Wolf is very efficient at getting ships repaired and back underway. They're just as efficient as they were at building ships. Yeah, uh, they knew that, what they that, were doing, which is going to be another yeah. key point I'm going to get into later. Is Harlan and Wolf? They didn't build bad ships. They they really and truly did. They knew what they were doing. They had been doing it for a long time, even before they got involved with the White Star Line. 
back they've been in building the they've been building quality ships uh, based on the designs and everything that they have been given so, so yeah so just to give you an idea as to how as to how experienced they are the olympic herself is hull number 400 that means that she is the oh, wow. 400th ship that that shipyard has produced titanic being hull number 401 so huh. they've been at it for quite a while wow yeah okay yeah. they definitely were <laughs> I'll call that experience. Yes, very much so. Now, yes, ships that they built sank. But you can say that about any shipyard that has ever produced any ship. Right. No one to this day has ever produced a ship that is truly, in every conceivable way, unsinkable. So how did this this so, um, event kind of uh, like affect the the what construction ultimately of Titanic. happened yeah. with this delay effectively meant that the Titanic's maiden voyage was pushed back from March 20th of 1912 to April 10th, 1912. That's a significant change. That's a significant delay. Now, what's impressive is technically, when you look at the, the White Star Line's printed as scheduled sailing schedule for the Titanic, uh -huh. which they had already planned out months in advance. They knew when Titanic would be ready. Harlan and Wolf was very efficient. And they they would say a date, and the ship would be ready by or before that date. The, the shipyard was like Scotty on steroids. It's great. <laughs> um, but anyways, so the Titanic would have originally sailed on March 20th. Now, here's here's why I say it would have always sunk. Because when you look at the sailing dates... The Titanic would have sailed its second voyage from Southampton on April 10th, 1912. Mm. In the same situation, the same events that were already happening on that date would have already happened. The coal strike happening in Southampton that prevented them from getting enough quality anthracite coal in order to fuel all their ships. Meaning that the White Star Line and any other big shipping companies there, such as the American Line, they had the New York which they couldn't get enough coal for, so they had to just kind of tie it up alongside uh, one of the White Star liners that was sitting there, the Oceana. Uh, which, here's the funny thing, the Titanic was actually meant to uh, uh, replace... Actually, I'm sorry, it was actually meant to replace the Teutonic, which was a previous liner. The Oceanic was also due to be bumped off of the Southampton service because the Britannic was up next to be built. So Oceanic was kind of the lesser one and left off tied off in the New York. The New York being very key to the Titanic story. Okay. In the same way that when the Olympic passed within one, and the Hawk was passing at that time within one to 200 yards. It was very, very close. So when the Titanic, well within 100 yards or thereabouts, passed by the ocean liner New York that was tied up, it suddenly pulled the New York slowly out from its berth and towards the Titanic as it started to get underway. And at okay. this point, the Titanic was moving, I think, about 12 knots thereabouts, enough that this bulk of what is now a 1,000, 1,015, they're about tons heavier than the Olympic now, uh, is moving through the water slowly past it and is pulling it out. And it mm. nearly impacts the side of the Titanic. Okay. It wow. comes within about one or two meters and basically renders the entire ma maiden voyage on pause for about an hour. Real quick. While they assess. Yep. I was going to say, yeah, uh, let me address this here. So Tits and Raygun says, next time you do a shipwreck stream, legal vices would be handy. He's a maritime lawyer who covers ship disasters. Yeah, I actually love to watch Jeff. I was actually on his stream on uh, Friday. So, uh, yeah, I'm actually quite familiar with uh, legal vices. Jeff is a great guy. Uh, I know that time zone differences, it's like nine, 10 in the morning over there where he lives. So he is at work right now. Uh, I did send him a link to the stream, not like a, to join the actual stream, but I sent him a link, you know, just cause I figured he'd be working and whatnot and probably wouldn't be able to do anything. So it, yeah, I, I do. I do know about it, and as much as I would love to have Jeff on for this, because I think I think these two would really uh, click, especially. But like um, 
yeah, I, I would love to have Jeff on, but I mean, I know that he's working, so totally, uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Yeah, Jeff, love you, buddy. All right, sorry, and continue on. Um, <clears throat> goodness, where was I? Sorry, I was looking over. Uh, you were, so yeah, the uh, there were. Yeah, the two ships, uh, they were moving past each other. You were talking yes. about the coal strike. Yeah. Yes, so the New York was uh, basically slowly slowly being pulled out by that uh, suction force towards the Titanic. The The counter was very, very close, but then it came within about a meter or two and was only stopped by Captain Smith seeing what was happening, ordering the engines full of stern, kind of reversing that propeller thrust and kind of starting to try to push the new york so to speak by creating that reverse thrust but also the help of the tugboat the uh, hercules i believe is the name of that tugboat uh came up alongside was able to quickly get a line on the new york and towed it out of the way and got that ship out of there and towed it further up uh up the quay uh up the quay side uh key side sorry i realize that's uh, a difference in pronunciation but uh, <laughs> key side um <clears throat> And ultimately, the the Titanic was sitting there for between about 45 minutes to an hour. Now, whether or not 45 minutes to an hour is enough time for that iceberg to drift 100 yards out of the way of the Titanic, we'll never be able to say 100% right. certain. But, be that as it may, even with this significant delay and change into the timeline of Titanic's construction, it still doesn't change the fact it, it almost seems like, regardless of anything that would have happened, Titanic was almost scheduled to meet that iceberg at that exact spot and the night of April 14th, 1912. Even with Titanic, cool. even yeah. with Captain Smith altering, the, uh, altering his course 10 miles further south to try to avoid this reported ice field, he still, unfortunately, ran afoul of one. Yep. Fortunately, some of the worst can happen to some of the best. It happens. Yeah, and that's something we've seen in a lot of disasters just over over the course of history. Sometimes, sometimes the best laid plans just they don't pan out, and you might compensate for one issue only to run into a completely other one. Absolutely. So we got so we've covered a little bit of that, and like that definitely sets kind of the stage for yeah this thing was gonna be in that position no matter what so now i've kind of uh i i'm i'm, I'm interested here kind of uh just kind of go through some of the overall just like some of the very like the strange timing of some of this so you mentioned um let's see so we are going to cover a couple of uh more conspiracy mystery topics. I just want to go ahead and do like a quick kind of, uh, we're going to hit these points over the course of the, uh, of the show as, uh, Harlock here kind of builds our narrative and kind of gets everything going for us. So there's a interesting hypothesis that's always been put out there that the Olympic was exchanged in place of the Titanic and there was another one where, you know, kind of there's a lot of conspiracy around the idea. Like, was she deliberately sunk by the Rothschilds? And then there's the question of one of the people who actually died on the uh, the maiden voyage of the Titanic was John Jacob Astor IV, who was a major, uh, like, tycoon of the time period. And he died on the ship and he was one of the few people that apparently was a like actually a detractor of the formation of the Federal Reserve so there's kind of some speculation that he might have been bumped off to kind of because he could have fi done something to stop the creation of the Federal Reserve it's kind of a conspiracy theory that's out there, but I mean, we're just kind of kind of hit the bullet points and then we'll, mm -hmm. uh, you all can make your own decisions on, on that. We'll just kind of, uh, now the one thing I, 
I will say about that particular theory, um, because it, it seems to involve both John Jacob Astor, uh, Benjamin Guggen, uh, Guggenheim, uh, and uh, Isidore Strauss, uh, founder of the Macy's department store. Um, it, it seems to involve those three in particular uh, in eliminating them. Now, with regards to John Jacob Astor and Guggenheim, uh, Guggenheim Guggenheim, goddamn. <laughs> um, it's uh, it seems that the it seems that they they really haven't like publicly, at least spoken out uh, against it. Uh, from what I've been able to gather, I I don't know if privately if if there is any sort of correspondence or anything that may exist of, of them privately maybe talking about this behind closed doors, behind closed parlor doors. I mean. Let's be frank. It's entirely it's, possible, but yeah. It is entirely possible, but officially, publicly, there's nothing that they've set out. Now, there being an exception for Isidore Strauss, but the, the, the whole idea about sinking an entire ocean liner along with the many other innocent people who have literally nothing to do with this at the end of the day except paying some taxes. Right. Because, Pretty quite frankly, most of those people were about to become taxpayers of the United States. <laughs> That's pretty insidious, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it 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 boggles the mind that that particular conspiracy. But I mean, there is that what if that you know. I mean, heck, there have been uh, there have been stranger things happening. Yeah, <laughs> other ships so... have been sunk for uh, <laughs> similar reasons, or have even been attacked for uh, similar reasons, even for political reasons. But. So I do have um, a, a potential uh, topic here that kind of you, you you had mentioned to me prior to the show and whatnot. Something that it kind of was, as you said, a contributor to the ultimate disaster. So tell me about the theory regarding the plating on the Titanic. So... Yeah, so there, there seems to be some detractors in both the quality of steel that Harlan and Wolf was using, uh, but then also some talk about the expansion joints of the Olympic class causing yeah, trauma. Yeah, you mentioned the expansion joints too, yes. Yes, now my only problem, and, and that, there was a theory that was touted heavily by History Channel and a few different documentaries that came out in the early 2000s, well, I, I think somewhere around 2005-ish to 2010-ish, somewhere in there. Um, but the, the thing of it is, and I, 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 do, I don't entirely agree with it, I, only because the expansion joint ends immediately above the strength deck, which let me show you kind of whereabouts that is. Okay. Actually, There we go. Got it. All right. So the Titanic, what's important to know about expansion joints on, on ocean liners, especially as liners of this size. Uh, your mic again is kind of uh There you go. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Now you're coming oh. through. Okay. Excellent. So the significance of expansion joints on the Olympic class liner, as with most large liners, over 40,000 tons, it seems, thereabouts. Some, some even there, a little bit smaller. But 
uh, is while a ship of this size is in a heavy sea and a significant storm, the ship is so long that rather than riding over waves, it actually bridges waves. It not only does that, but then when it passes through a wave, then the fore section, the aft section are completely almost yeah, dangling the, in the trough. The trough, yeah. Exactly. It's one of the so, reasons they think that the Edmund Fitzgerald broke up. Exactly, of that hull flexing. Now, here's the thing. The Titanic and her sisters of the Olympic class were designed with that type of wave motion in mind. So they knew this ship was going to be encountering some incredible storms on the open Atlantic Ocean. So they allowed the... Now, what's important to understand about the ductility uh, of, of steel is that it was built to a, to a certain strength, but not. it was designed not to be too brittle with a, with a good amount of carbon, con uh, carbon concentration in, in it to help it be uh, a little bit more flexible, if you will, uh, to help it... I don't want to say bend, but to withstand the shocks and forces of the open ocean. Um, now, this particular area right here, you can see the aft expansion joint. Mm -hmm. Whilst the hull is flexing in a storm, this long 882 and a half or 882 foot nine inch hull is flexing very subtly back and forth up and down, I realize I'm a bit too close, but gradually, very slowly and subtly doing that. Like you wouldn't be able to really visually see it or notice it, but the hull is doing it. The superstructure without those expansion joints would be damaged and would be pressed together. So they just basically create that just opening enough to where that upper part of the ship where all the very nice first class uh, entertainment and uh, reception rooms and so forth, uh, smoking lounges in there and so forth. Uh, ensuring that there's no damage that happens structurally to that area. Okay. So it allows it to kind of flex a little bit. Um, so the aft expansion joint being very, very close to where the breakup actually happened, um, the problem is, is that the expansion joint, when you follow it all the way through, it actually ends right here. It does not go down any further into the ship. It continues all the way to the other side there. So it almost entirely separates this upper section from the rest of the hull. It's almost like a model, if you will. Huh. So the thing is, is that whilst the ship is down at you know an 11 to 15 degree angle as it's sinking, yes, it's starting to flex that upper portion just a little bit only because the hull is naturally designed with, with the quality of steel that's put into it to flex that ever so slight bit. While the hull is flexing right here at the strength deck, which is C deck, it's doing its job and holding together. This upper portion will would have slowly come apart and come open. But the problem is, is that it, it wouldn't continue to separate down into this plating as it's it's kind of separated. It's 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 not conducive to allowing a tear, if you will, to continue down into the rest of the hull. Now, what ultimately happened is an old, a structural failure across this entire section, if you will, where ultimately the ship, no one, no one designs a ship to be able to sustain half of itself out of the water. I mean, heck, putting a ship in dry dock as, it's, as it is it's stressful is, enough on the superstructure. It's, it's quite a lot. You have to place blocks in just the right position. And you have to design your ship in such a way that you're designing it with the intention of those blocks in the future when you go into a dry dock are going to go at these exact positions along your keel, along your bilge keels, out to the side. Like, you have to design it in a very specific way to hold itself together, especially out of water. That's a problem that a lot of museum ships have that keep their ships out of water uh, because there's no... When a ship sits in water, it has a force that pushes in, sorry, pushes in on all sides yep, of the hull. Evenly. Yeah. Exactly. When There's you no longer pressure. have that force, the hull starts to sag downward. That was something they found with HMS Victory, for instance, as it sat in a dry dock for so long, is that it started to come across, and they realized they had to do some emergency repairs very quick to keep the ship all together uh, and keep that from happening. Real quick, so, hey Impish, how you doing? Good to you see take you. take something that's you know twenty five to thirty thousand tons, and that's about the weight of the stern section that was being lifted out of the water. 
Uh, and, and it's literally not being supported by anything. By anything. By, by anything at all. I mean, you look at these engines. These things are massive. These, to this day, these are the largest reciprocating steam engines that have ever been built and installed on anything. The, and and I mean, just, look, just looking at those yeah. pictures right there, I mean, you can imagine the size of those pistons. I mean, if it's, I mean, it looks like the pistons themselves were almost the size of a, of a you know, full size stateroom they absolutely were um i could read you some specifics there but they are uh, they are insanely massive uh and it had two sets of these powering the two outer propellers on all of the olympic class ships and these things were absolutely enormous and they weighed many 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 tons between all of the each of the columns that hold this up i think is like I want to say about 120 tons for each of those columns. Jesus. Uh, the base of this, oh God, I'm straining my mind to remember. I want to say the base is like somewhere between like 300 to 400 tons, something like that in itself. And then you have the weight of all the piston heads and everything else. It's it, it's it's quite a lot. Uh, I wouldn't want to mention, change the rings on those. <laughs> yes. Not to mention right next door, you have a low pressure steam turbine that's ultimately providing that... Uh, uh, power that turning power to the central propeller on all the Olympic class ships, be yep. it you know uh, whatever design of propeller they're carrying. Um, but yeah, ultimately you had that weight, and it caused a slow but gradual structural failure. Now, what's really neat is this: the, the structural failure didn't happen until right at the end, and we know this because the lights of, on the Titanic they stayed on until just seconds before the breakup started to occur. Now, what's important to know is the breakup started to ultimately occurred at a much shallower angle than what we saw in the movie Titanic. It, was, it wasn't completely out of the water. It was an ultimate, I kind of wish I had a model here to show you, but it was only at about a 15 degree angle thereabouts when this breakup started to happen. Um, and a lot of the breakup, a lot of the drama of it, while some of it was on the surface, a lot of it did actually happen under the water. And it kind of makes sense why some of the people in the lifeboats swore they saw Titanic sink in one piece and some of based on their perspective. And some of them absolutely swore up and down that they saw uh, it break apart. So you get people saying it sank in one piece, people saying it broke apart and no real general consensus. But it, it, it seemed at the time that more people, especially upper class, it seemed people were saying they saw it sink in one piece. So it was just generally accepted as being as such. But there was always that lingering question and doubt until 1985 when dr robert ballard found the wreck yeah and let me see but, while you uh, uh kind of go on about that let me see if i might be able to find yeah an, a more accurate video on that see if there's like somebody's created like a rendering of that breakup that would be fantastic uh if, if someone has created one uh showing that low angle breakup um it's it's possible i, I can't think off the top of my head where one would find that. Let me see what uh, I can find. But it's possible. Um, but yeah, this this breakup started to happen at a much lower, much less dramatic angle than what we, you know, or, originally imagined with, you know, the movie Titanic. Um, and what's interesting, though, to note is the Britannic, the even slightly heavier than Titanic, sister of Titanic, uh, as we know, it did sink in the First World War after striking a, a mine laid by a German submarine in the uh, Aegean Sea uh, in the Mediterranean. It was like off the coast of uh, the island of Kia in Greece. Um, and it took on water up forward, went down by the bow, its stern rose up. Now, it took only about, I think, 48 minutes to sink compared to the two hours and 21, I think, minutes of the Titanic uh, to go down. Um, so significantly less time. But what's interesting to note is while the Britannic stern was raised up in the air for quite some time, it did not break in half and is still in one, relatively one entire piece on the bottom of the uh, Aegean Sea. So it almost makes me wonder if the Britannic sank a little bit slower and had more time with its stern directly suspended in the air, would it have broken up as well? Would it have suffered the same structural failures? We'll never know, for sure, unless someone actually goes in and does a very, very good uh, 
uh, simulation and modeling of it, which that would be very cool to see. Yeah, I'm trying to find something about it. I did actually want to show uh, a quick photo that I forgot I actually had archived for this. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, yeah, that's about the best I can do. So. I did find something that we could kind of go through here. It's okay. also got this guy's uh, commentary. I'm actually, I am going to mute the commentary just because I haven't had a chance to really parse this out and go through it ahead of time. That's fine. Yeah. But um, I'll just let folks know if they want to go and watch the full video that uh, they can go there and watch it. One second here. And present here. So this is courtesy of a channel by the name of Ocean Liner Design. Yes, he is another one I've actually, I follow a lot. Okay. Yes, I love him. So he's, he's got a simulation here the of kind of like more how it would have looked. So yeah, mm -hmm. a much, much less of a, of a rise out of the rear half than mm -hmm. you would have thought. So let me go ahead and just play that. I'm going to play without sound. Folks, if you want to see this video, I will try to remember to leave a link in the description so that way if anybody wants to watch it, you can go and watch it yourself and whatnot. But uh, yeah, please do. It's he does fantastic work. Uh, I I, I've, I keep up with his videos. He's actually one of the one of the guys I'm subscribed to. So please, I, I recommend everyone check him out. Mike Brady is his name, and he does some fantastic work. Okay. Uh oh. Yeah, here we go. Hang so let's go out. So what's interesting to know, uh, if you want to pause the video for just one second. Yeah. Um, so as you can see, the lights just went out there. So in the area, uh, I believe it is on C deck, I believe. Uh, either on D deck or C deck. I think it's actually C deck. So right in that first deck where it's painted white, there is an auxiliary, uh, auxiliary uh, electrical generator, two sets of them. And they're partially credited for being why the Titanic was kept illuminated right up until the final seconds. Whilst there were uh, four sets, um, I'm sorry. Yes, I believe four, no, no, no. I think it was actually eight sets of them. Electrical steam generators back in the very stern of the Titanic. There's a little bitty narrow room right between the, the two outer propellers, like dead in the center of the ship. If you look at the plans where it's kind of this narrow room, that's for these big electrical, they're little bitty steam engines. They're, well, we say little, but they're big to us, especially yeah. small compared to the giant ones that are turning the propellers. But anyways, they're generating electricity. And honestly, I those guys were never really heard from. Um, so we do have to give credit to them. But then also the guys that were up top keeping those generators up in the uh, upper section going as well so that way if one failed they would always have that reserve power now what's interesting what's important to note those electrical generators only work for as long as they have steam pressure in in the pipes so there was already so the second the lights go out that's when the titanic is actually suffering from internal structural failures that's where seams are coming apart that's where the duct work is coming apart. That's where everything inside that we can't entirely see from the outside. And the one thing I will say about this animation by Mike Brady is I personally think it was darker than this. He's made it a little bit brighter so you can see it. On that particular night, uh, it was a waning crescent. It was it was in like one of its final stages. It was only given between what's estimated between five to 10% illumination. So it was dark that night. That was part of the reason why they couldn't see the iceberg, along with some other reasons I'll get into. Yeah. But I, I, 
I think even the people in the lifeboat would have struggled to pick out the details to notice maybe it was breaking apart because it was so freaking dark. There was uh, another simulation video that I did find, and yeah, it it was almost pitch black. Whenever they they have the, the ship yeah. lights and the ship lights go out, and that's like, the, and that's exactly what the people in the lifeboat would have seen. They would have seen starlight, uh, and the other lights they would have seen are just the the slanting lines of the incandescent bulbs still going aboard the Titanic and being powered. And, and it's, it's the other thing too, you gotta think, the Titanic was at that degree of angle and there were still men in the aft boiler rooms maintaining that auxiliary steam pressure. There were still men at their posts because they knew that if, you know, if they didn't stay, all oh, hell would break loose. Could you imagine this disaster from the, if, you know, uh, not even an hour into the wreck, if suddenly uh, the, the lights, lights went out. out? Like, oh my God. Like, hey, cool. It would have been Panic so much worse. Have ensued. <laughs> but yep. uh, they, 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 they stayed at their, at their post. They kept that, uh, the steam pressure up so that way the, electri the electrical generators could continue spinning and the lights could stay on. And everyone could try as best they can to find their way off. So it's, it's interesting to note that this is the point where Titanic is coming apart on the inside first because yep. the lights go out and because of that severing of the steam pipes. Yep. And but Barbara that's Vance, the only thing I wanted to really point out about this uh, in this animation so far. Yeah, Barbara Vance says it's pretty insane to think about. Yes, absolutely. And that's part of the reason why this has boggled my mind since I was like four years old. So I just, ugh, it's it's incredible to think I'm about. I'm going to go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and roll uh, the clip and continue that there. Absolutely. So this is kind of where you start to see the breakup happening. The funnels collapse. Now, one thing that, yeah, that makes a lot more sense is that it, the separation might happen. The front half, which is already full, would start to just go down, while the rear half, which is not full yet, is just going to kind of sit there for a so little pause bit. Pause the animation for one second. Sorry. Yeah. Only because like, I want you to continue talking, but like we're getting to a point that needs to be addressed. Yes. So um, at this point, the the stern section is still partially attached to the bow section, even though it's not animated here, it's not being shown. Below the water line, yeah. Exactly. Now, what's important to note about the, the Olympic class of ocean liners is they were all designed with a double-bottomed hull along the full length of the ship, so that way if it ever ran over anything, the theory was that that would be able to take the impact of that. So uh, even though the front half is still technically attached to the front, it's going to start probably dragging it down. Exactly, and it's going to start dragging that down until finally it gets to a point where it detaches and falls away. Um, now, ultimately, a lot of the smashing and the breaking and so forth, uh, a lot of what we saw here was, was really from sea deck and above. Right. Whereas in the movie Titanic, we see a lot more than that. We see almost the whole wedding cake as it were come apart and come open uh this you can almost imagine if you weren't looking in the right place or if you were maybe looking at it from a stern or if your boat had gone out in this direction maybe you wouldn't have immediately noticed it uh right then and there especially because all the lights just went out so you you're trying to pick out shapes in the darkness effectively right um especially at this point you're seeing more of an absence of light and hearing the screams of those that are more immediately swimming away from the ship and are still on the ship um for a moment the ship does ride itself as we see itself here and that's partially because uh those watertight compartments in the stern of the ship they've yet to flood at all they're still maintaining some degree of positive buoyancy um but the weight of those massive engines still being attached to the stern part that coupled with that little bit of double bottom hull still being attached is what's going to drag it forward into that final plunge there yeah all right i know we've got him paused i know mike Rady's yeah let me explaining that right now but yeah. that's <laughs> yeah let me go ahead and yeah we'll just continue so yeah it's starting to pull down you kind of see how the way the weight looks it looks like something is pulling it down yeah and then i'm pretty sure it's gonna bob for a second once that thing releases And it's heartbreaking to think about this, too, because of how many third-class passengers ultimately turned back to their staterooms. And a lot of those families in third class, they were 
quartered in the stern section of the ship. So ultimately, yeah. they would be inside those rooms being thrown about, the floor becoming the wall, the, you know, the wall becoming the floor, the ceiling becoming the wall, and in pitch blackness too. Yeah. And the last thing they would know is the pressure increasing around them as the ship goes under the water. And honestly, it in an instant the you know the window may give out or the water may just absolutely find them through the various corridors and passageways but ultimately yep. in a blink um once it goes onto the surface not too long after it'd be all over but uh but yeah that was uh yeah <laughs> tragic wow. and uh devastating and had quite an impact on the world at large Yep, I see a super chat just came in. Oxana said, the Andersons. Yep. Yep. So, that kind of gives us a little bit of, like, how she broke up, kind of, like, what happened, like, in the moment there. So, let's kind of take it, uh, let's take it back just a little bit here. Let's kind of... Uh, backtrack we we started with the expansion joints yes. and whatnot so another thing that you had mentioned yeah tits and ray guns says drowning is a rough way to go yeah drowning is a rough way but bear in mind the vast majority of people that went into the water that night didn't drown the vast majority had life belts on they froze to death their death right. came within about 20 minutes about 20 to 25 minutes after the ship disappeared from the surface. And like, Hypothermia. Yes. 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 That's what ultimately got almost all of them. A few of them did drown, and we know this because some of their corpses that were recovered, they did inhale water. So yes, we do know that some did drown, but the vast majority were hypothermic. Yep. And say the pressure inside would have been worse, I think. Yeah, I, I'm not in. I don't yeah. argue that. Let's say oh, yeah. just that sheer pressure. I mean, I mean, hell, I get a headache with whatever the uh, pressure drops around here. I can only imagine what, you know. Yep. I mean, it probably would have been enough to maybe even rupture eardrums. Yeah, I imagine. I imagine the last thing that some of these, some of them would have known, was just a kind of. I mean, if you can, it's hard to imagine that much pressure on your head. Uh, you, your eardrums would have burst. Uh, you would have heard just this, you would have felt it around your body as it built up, basically. And I think before they were crushed by any pressure, though, that window would have given out. Yeah. In an instant, a wall of water that was under intense pressure itself would have just come like a f giant fist into each and every one of those rooms. Yep. So, it's... It's not a way to die. I, I, with all the, it, it may, makes me think too about just the reports of what happens on a submarine uh, when it goes below its crush depth. It's, yeah, I, I did one time. Like I, I was reading about uh, the disaster of the, um, of the Aro San Juan, the uh, diesel uh, submarine that sank, and how that went down. And Jesus Christ, if you ever want to, yeah. want nightmare fuel, say the video of that, like the simulation version of like what would have happened like how that thing would have just been crushed underwater yeah very frightening there is and i'm trying to think of the name of it off the top of my head and i, I can't think if it's um hey rosman how you doing buddy i want to say the k9 but i'd have to look it up it's the british were interesting with their submarines they put a letter and then a number you know that's kind of how they, they did things um but there was one in particular that they were taking on a test uh, that you know it, it had just been completed and they were doing a, a test on it Ooh, me. and the submarine was on the surface and they were doing oh a test i remember on, that yeah and it basically did this number where the tail was just barely bobbing out of the water in the forward section the forward section was literally so deep the forward section reached crush depth and imploded and it's just oh yikes so let me kind of bring us back around. Yes. So I, mean, I can easily get off topic. Yeah, I'm sorry, everyone it's, out there. <laughs> it's fine. I say I, I think we're actually doing pretty good, uh, all things considered. So, right. so there there was another 
potential cause to the disaster or at least a contributor definitely that you mentioned here and that was there was potentially a fire in the coal bunker yeah so this has gone this has been one that's gone around for for a while uh in the various tabloids and the various uh forums here and there and everywhere um and it it has to do with a coal fire that had started in the forward, I think it was the forward starboard coal bunker of the number six boiler room, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And effectively what it was, uh, it started a few days before the Titanic had uh, even arrived in Southampton. I think it, it started sometime while it was transitioning from Belfast to Southampton. And effectively, uh, over the period of the next few days and into the maiden voyage of the Titanic, the stokers uh, gradually were trying to remove the coal from that uh, coal bunker and shift it over and effectively get to the seat of the fire. Now, the theory goes that, that these theorists have put out there is that this fire, through the heat of the, the heat that was produced in some way weakened the hull of the Titanic. So that way, when it did strike the iceberg, it was somehow weakened. So well, Ros real quick, Rosman Ranch says, this is so interesting. I'll have to go back and catch up. I love this stuff. Great to have you, Rosman Ranch. And yes, definitely. Um, so for anybody who hasn't, uh, who was kind of like just getting into the show, whatnot. So uh, our guest tonight, this is uh, Grand Admiral Harlock. He's a good friend of mine. And, uh, this was one of those where we were we got to talking about the the, th the idea for this stream, and it just the timing could not have been more perfect because two days from now is the anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. So well, yeah, two days from the striking of the iceberg, three days from the sinking. Let's, let's it technically yes. went down on the fifteenth, but you know, after midnight. Yep, after midnight. <laughs> yep. So. Yeah, definitely go back, check out uh, the rest of the show. This is definitely, I'm I'm learning as much as you guys are because there's a lot of this stuff that, I mean, I kind of, like, I had heard a little bit here and there. But, I mean, the you know, this, you know, the fire in the coal bunker, the expansion joints, this uh, this other stuff, I had no idea about any of this. So I'm learning along with you guys and kind of, you know, so if you guys also, if you're in the chat and you have questions, throw them out there and we will definitely tackle them. So, yeah. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, so you were saying the coal bunkers, there was a fire, the f could have uh, disrupted the metallurgy, which, which yes, I do know exactly. a little bit about metallurgy in that so, if you have tempered steel and you introduce it to more heat, it can actually weaken the integrity of that steel. And whilst that is absolutely true, the important thing to know, there's, there's two key factors here to know. One is coal bunker fires, they're not raging infernos. What they are, they're smoldering embers, essentially. Now, it's, it's important slow, to know that in, in the coal bunkers of the steamship, yeah. it is a very hot and a dry atmosphere. It, it's, it's the perfect environment for coal, especially high-quality coal, to suddenly spontaneously combust. I know that sounds crazy, but that does happen in the right conditions. And in the heat... And the dry of a coal bunker in a steamship that has happened on many occasions before Titanic and after Titanic. In fact, is one of the reasons, in addition to the sheer number of men required to move the coal into the furnaces, why in the 1920s and after World War One, companies started switching to oil-fired boilers instead. Much easier to handle oil than coal, and you don't have the spontaneous combustion uh, unless you really intend to set off oil. But that to one side. Um, coal, when it burns in a, in a coal bunker fire, it typically does not get above 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It's very much like the embers after you put out a, after a campfire kind of starts to die down. It is the heat of those embers or even in your, in your fireplace after the flames die down, you have those very hot core of it embers. That's kind of what you, kind of what you have to imagine is smoldering. And yep. what has been slowly growing in that coal bunker over a few days' time. Okay. Now, in order for you to effectively disrupt the structural integrity of steel, 
That is to just slightly move it, to just weaken it enough to get that under significant pressure, you can bend or flex it. You have to get it to a bare minimum of 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's not to smelt it, that's not to rework it, that's not to, that that's requires degrees of about 3,000 degrees. This is just enough to budge it and just enough to weaken it, that it would be considered structurally unsafe. Hmm. Real quick there. Um, so Shinny Graham Yellrock say, good to see you, Shinny. I'm listening to you guys while listening to Mighty Play, so catch me up on what we're doing today as I just got here. Oh, and I'm annoying. <laughs> no, you're not, <laughs> Shinny. We love you. Coffee really quick, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll go ahead and kind of do a real quick recap there. Excellent. So, yeah. So, Shinny, what, where's where we're at? So, we're talking about the disaster aboard the Titanic. So, obviously, it's it's a subject that has been kind of talked to death. But there's a lot of mysteries and a lot of speculation that I think have kind of been overlooked and a lot of information that has kind of, I guess you could say, has been kind of like gone by the wayside. So there's a lot of also details that I think historically get, some details get over-sationalized while others kind of don't get the play that they, they deserve. So... That's definitely where we're talking about. And so one of the first things we talked about was that the Titanic actually had it was delayed out of harbor because of a actual collision with her with a because of a collision between uh, her sister ship, the Olympic, and uh, a smaller uh, sailing vessel, military vessel that required the use of dry dock. And so they had to bring the Titanic in for dry dock repairs or they had to bring the Olympic in for dry dock repairs and put a Titanic out, which delayed it for a couple of weeks so they could continue construction on it, which caused a significant enough delay is how they ended up sailing late and going across on their maiden voyage in April instead of in March. And there's some significant speculation that Given the amount of travel time, you know, she would have been on her way back from Southampton, on her way back to Liverpool whenever she would have encountered the ice iceberg on her trip back. So it seems like this would, I mean, they would have possibly hit this iceberg almost no matter what. Pretty interesting there. Uh, we were talking about also one of the things that kind of led to her breakup was the structural joints, and we were kind of talking about the weight of the ship as well as possibility of um, poor quality steel. We're right now talking about there was another theory that was put forward about a fire that actually had been smoldering for a couple of days in one of the coal bunkers. And the coal bunkers are basically where they store all the coal to power the uh, turbines that push the pistons and allow the, the uh, propellers to turn. So very fascinating that, I mean, cause I had no, I had never heard of this idea about a, uh, a fire in the coal bunker before I had never heard this. So I'm learning a lot of this at kind of, as we go, uh, my, my good friend here, uh, grand Amber Harlock, he is a expert on this far more than I am. I'm actually learning a lot with you guys tonight. So very cool that we get to do this. And, so yeah, I've walked over this. <laughs> Cole ain't your friend yet. Uh, thank you, Barbara and Kaiser. Titanic is a cool story, though. Mostly makes me want to know the quality of steel is good. Yeah. It, it It's definitely, there's, there's a lot of things that, you know, it, it makes you really wonder, like, how this would have gone down. Uh, never heard of the fire part before, but I was like, look in, but the only one, thanks for the update. Yep. So yeah, that's kind of gets us up to speed on everything that's been going on so far. Kind of, uh, what's been going on there real quick. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I say, uh, 
He had to go grab something real quick. I've got to do something here. Okay, good. You're back. I'm back. Sorry about that. Oh, you're good. You're good. So, yeah, we were just getting uh, shinny caught up, and we're all good. So uh, continue on about the coal bunker there. Yeah, so the the fire, uh, I mean, ultimately, it, it, it did smolder over the course of several days. Um, of course, like I said, the estimated highest temperature that coal, coal bunker fires have been known to reach is about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It could easily uh, have fluctuated a little bit below or above that, that mark. Um, but quite frankly, it is just not enough to cause that steel to warp in any such degree or to weaken it. Um, now, what's really interesting to note is it was kind of a benefit that this happened because it forced the trimmers and the stokers to move that coal from the starboard bunker over to the port side and also to burn it off and use it first, meaning that the starboard side, the right side of the ship, was ever so slightly lighter than the left side or the port side. Now, this is important on the night of April 14th, 1912. Uh, at around 11.40 p.m. when the Titanic does encounter that iceberg and takes damage as that ensured that the water that's coming in on the starboard side through these little bitty uh, openings all along the length of about 200, 220 feet, something like that, uh, along the hull of the ship, effectively... Uh, <clears throat> Effectively, when it flooded, when it started to flood in and started to weigh down the starboard side and started to initially pull it down, that weight of the extra coal being on the port side ensured that the ship kind of started to sink on an e even level uh, uh, tilt. It, it wasn't listing too much to one side or the other. Otherwise, had that coal not been trimmed, the sudden influx of the weight of that water that might have cantered it over to starboard, which is exactly what happened to the slightly bigger sister ship of the Titanic, the Britannic, when it encountered that mine in World War I. She started to roll over to her starboard side uh, significantly, so much so that it became kind of a challenge to get the lifeboats launched. So it was a little bit of an advantage that that situation did happen because it forced them to move that weight of all of that coal. Uh, to use up all that was in the starboard side and to shift over the left, ensuring that when she did take on water, uh, it did not uh, in excess affect, in excessively affected the trim of the ship. And she sank more or less on an even trim within just a few degrees. There were, it was noted by the men on the, on the bridge that there were a few, a few degrees list here and there, but for the most part, it was level. I mean, it was one of the best, honestly, Titanic is an example of one of the best ship sinkings you can have in terms of how much time it allotted. Like, man, if only there was a few more lifeboats on board, but, uh, you know, that's hindsight for you. Um, yeah. So Rosamond Ranch says it's amazing with all the ship disasters I've learned about through legal vices, part-time explorer, maritime horrors, etc. How much press and attention the Titanic got. And then Barbara Vance also mentions Rosman Ranch. Well, given the number of people affected and the ultra powerful on board, it makes sense. Yeah. It absolutely does. Not to mention, Titanic is one of those cases that you couldn't write a story. You couldn't write, this couldn't not happen. And then you turn around and write it, and someone fully believed that this type of situation could actually happen. It, it, it's part of the reason why James Cameron's pitch was so successful is that it's 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 almost the perfect story of hubris of tragedy of man's attempt to conquer nature all encapsulated in one massive in attempt. one massive bungle yeah yes you know it's well there's there was also the kind of at the time one of the reasons why it got a lot of um a lot of like press at the time there was also if I remember correctly, there was a book published not long before that of a story about a similar exactly. ocean liner. So written in 1898, and I know his first name is Robert. I can't remember his last name off the top of my head. Um, but he wrote Futility or Wreck of the Titan. Now, 
what's interesting is the parallels in this story. Uh, uh, Morgan Robertson. There we go. Th thank you. Okay, so yes. Robertson. Thank you. Morgan Robertson. All right. So he wrote this book, and it's all about a passenger liner, a large four-funneled passenger liner. Named the Titan. Named the Titan, who is on its – the ship is on its maiden voyage heading to New York from Southampton. And the ship encounters an iceberg, sinks, and there is a massive loss of life due to both the rapidity in which it sinks, which – that's one significant difference from Titanic is that Titan went down very fast. But again, what's interesting to note is she had a very similar number of lifeboats as the Titanic. Very similar situation. So it's it, it is kind of unique kind of interesting that, you know, several, several years beforehand, there's there's a story about a ship bearing a suspiciously similar name with a vaguely similar description um and it's it's just it's the, the the parallels are remarkable and almost kind of scary right it's kind of like you, you have this moment of like man this is just this seems like way too much to be coincidence makes you wonder makes you wonder time travel mk ultra who knows <laughs> cue, the, cue the x files music <laughs> actually duh. I've got that. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> of course, I can't really uh, talk too much about uh, you know too many of those conspiracies, or otherwise things might happen. FBI, open up! <laughs> oh my! That's a kid. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right, so, and let me see here. So, shitting is a dang it, I turn on my computer. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, as long as you're here, Shenny, that's all that matters. <laughs> all right. So. Yeah, I didn't think I'd have enough material to fill out all this, and I realized I still have a lot more. <laughs> yeah, it, it's one of those, it's one of those where we could, I mean, we could go for a long time on this subject. I mean, I mean you I know, think we, we're, you get me talking about maritime history and ships. I mean, I'll, you wind me up, I'll go and go and go. Oh, yeah. And it, that that's one of the things I knew is like, I knew we would not have trouble filling a two hour show. <laughs> I mean, we're already in an hour and a half, so I knew we were good. <laughs> so, all right, let's kind of. I guess let's kind of turn inward a little bit here. Change course. So, slightly. <laughs> so there's a there's a really big conspiracy theory out there, and I kind of want you to tackle this because I figure you'd be the person to ask about it. So there's a there's a hypothesis that the ship was exchanged, like they swapped the Titanic and the Olympic in the wreck that think gets a, I, there's uh, a big conspiracy theory about that there's a lot of questions so mm -hmm. you know what? I'm, I'm gonna let you go off on that one and you know please if you've got resources or anything bring them up throw them at me and i will pull them up as we uh, go along but yeah this is a very interesting one because this is one i did not ever hear of before you know that yeah, uh, it's, yeah. Uh, it's it's an odd one and this, this is one i encountered a long time ago again i think this was some some nonsense i saw standing in line at a grocery store look o looked over at a tabloid and and saw it on the front page. it's one of those just bizarre out there stories that i read and i remembered even at that young age thinking that's that's that doesn't sound quite right to me and when you ultimately you 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 look at the differences there were there were significant structural and engineering differences between the olympic and titanic so much so that to swap the two ships by that late of date requires significant changes and realterations to the titanic to make it look back to how it looked as the olympic so earlier i had mentioned that collision with uh, that the olympics suffered with the hms hawk that royal navy protected cruiser Right now, when it had actually uh, gone in, and the Titanic had to be pulled out of its dry dock space, and the Olympic put in, at that time, 
and I do want to show, uh, first off, show this uh, picture. Let me share here. Sorry, I heard something over here. So this is a very nicely colorized photo of the Titanic in dry dock. This was shortly before she was taken out. Um, now, so this is a photograph that has been colorized. Colorized, that's right. Someone okay. did a very, very good job. Very good. That. Yes. Um, now, what's important to note, and I'm going to kind of, I'm going to show you a few different pictures of both the Olympic and Titanic here. But I want to point this out because this is Titanic's in-between stage where she, in some ways, still looks like Olympic, but in some ways has changed. And I'll kind of point these changes out as we go. Now, first and foremost, if you can see on B-deck here, this promenade opening, this is the second-class promenade. Now, originally, the second-class promenade extended all the way up to this point here, as you can see my mouse pointer there. And it was very long and open. Now, on, on the Olympic, it was always left open. Now, on Titanic, they decided to use some of that space, enclose the forward half, and use it as a uh, as a cafe. It's like a um, it was called a cafe Parisian. Actually, it was meant to simulate a sidewalk cafe, a cafe in Paris, and it had very different a la carte things that you could get. Uh, at various times of the day. It was, it was a very nice place to sit and enjoy tea and so forth. But that was a room that, uh, a, a space that only existed on Titanic and eventually the Britannic, as they implemented a lot of the improvements to, to Titanic on the Britannic as well. Now, that's one of the key differences that we can tell the difference of the Olympic and Titanic. Now, the other main one is this A deck promenade. Now, you can see it is open the all the way up and down. Now, Olympic throughout her entire career, that A deck promenade was left wide open. The Titanic, however, and I'll show you that in just a second, the forward up to right about here, so a little less than half, uh, about a third, a little over a third maybe, uh, of this a forward A deck promenade gets enclosed by these small square windows. And that becomes one of the most visual distinctions that we can tell Olympic and Titanic apart at a distance. There are a few other minor exterior differences. Uh, let me switch in images here really quick. There we go. This is actually of the swap occurring. Now, we can actually see Titanic has uh, been pulled out already of the dry dock and is sitting along the quayside here. This is the Olympic. The Olympic is getting ready to be nudged in and pushed forward into the dry dock here. The other distinct, distinct uh, difference that we can tell the two ships apart is in the cabs on the bridge wings, these little structures here and over here on the Titanic. They kind of jut out just a little bit. now. The Olympics is actually completely flush with the side of the ship. The Titanic, however, it came out between three to four feet from the side of the ship. And that three to four feet is just enough that in photographs... Yeah, you can see it there. You can clearly see it. Yeah. And one of the important things, one of the key passengers that was on board the Titanic, his name was Father Francis Brown. He was traveling in second class from Southampton to Queenstown, Ireland. So he got off at the last stop of the Titanic before it headed out across the Atlantic Ocean. His hobby was photography, and he took many, many photos. In fact, he is part of the reason why we have the, the amount of photos of, that we do of the Titanic's maiden voyage. He famously caught just before he boarded the tender in Queenstown, Queenstown Ireland to then take him into town because Titanic was far too big to actually dock alongside in Queenstown. Queenstown, if you ever, if you ever look at it, is a teeny tiny little, little town in, in the hillside, you know, seaside cliffs of Ireland. Um, and there's just not enough room for the Titanic to really pull in there. So a tender ship, a little steam paddle tender goes out to the Titanic and picks them up and brings them in. Well, just as he's boarding the tender, he looks up and snaps this photograph. 
and it's very famous of Captain Smith actually leaning out over the bridge wing over this exact window and i and i can pull up that photo yeah dude, let, me, let me see that uh photo if you look if you look as a matter of fact i can find it in about two seconds if you give me yeah absolutely Snap say real quick there shinny graham yell, yell Roxas. rose seems rose seems like she would have noticed them switching out the ship she knew right where to find her necklace <laughs> <laughs> i've been sitting on that one for a while i just i thought that was that was funny here we go i found it so i'm going to share this image here So oh, this yeah. is a famous photograph. And as we can see, the, bri the the cab, the bridge cab of this ship, whatever ship it is, is jutting out about three to four feet from the side of the ship. It is not flush and in line. Not to mention we know that Captain Edward John Smith was placed in command of the Titanic. Now, of course, you, know, you can forge paperwork all you like, but you can't make significant structural changes in that rapid a time. Harlan Wolf is good, but that, that's a tall order to just suddenly change the ships out to such a degree. And then on top of which, what's important to note about White Star Line ships and about the Olympic class in particular, their names weren't just painted on the sides of the ship. The steel was actually cut and their names were engraved into their hulls. This is part of the reason why we can actually identify Titanic on the bottom of the ocean because we can look at the name. We do, the paint has long since, we can't really see the paint, but we can see where that steel was cut, and we can see the T, the I, the T, the A, the N, the I, the C. We can see it. We know that, that, type, that the ship at the bottom of the ocean is Titanic because its steel was cut in the name of Titanic. So ultimately, wow. at the end of the day, that whole conversation about it potentially being Olympic is bunkus. Yeah, okay, because, I yeah, I had... I actually didn't know that it was embossed into the steel with the name. That's I'd it always a real just stamp. Like this is the name of this ship. Now, I now on the stern, I can't say a hundred percent if the stern was also engraved. I think it was, but I know on the bow on either side of the ships that that was cut into. Uh, it's actually some really neat. If you build models of the Titanic, you can actually get some neat photo etching, which actually kind of shows that little detail yeah. where it's kind of inset. Really neat stuff. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we like model building so much is that there's just there's little tiny details you don't think would make a lot of difference, but make a huge amount of difference. To the, to the person who knows what they're looking for and also to the joy in the heart of the builder to know that any time anyone looks at that and recognizes it, ah, it brings satisfaction. Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. Very cool. So, yeah, that, uh, that puts paid to that, I think. Uh, that pretty well uh, disproves that whole notion. Not to mention, I mean, Olympic, it's important to note, Olympic lived out a very, very long life. There's a reason why the ship is known as Old Reliable. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and take your screen off until oh, you're ready to share that again. That's fine. Sorry. <laughs> No, it's fine. I just I, I have uh, I have flashbacks to a particular Nick Ricada stream where he started scrolling through uh, Twitter and accidentally ended up with something that he wasn't supposed to show on YouTube on the screen and went, "Oh crap!" <laughs> no, it's okay. That's not gonna. Literally, all the tabs yeah. I have open are all about ships. Or in case I need an immediate reference to something, and then my background of my computer, which is as you probably would have guessed, right? A ship. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those I'm like, never can be too careful. <laughs> this is fair. This is fair. Uh, Barbara Vance, <laughs> my, my sons went to see it ten times, the movie Titanic. They say it was their so obsession as little kids. Parents, we took them to, uh, on tours of ships and subs. Very cool. I remember uh, my mother taking me to uh, the IMAX theater downtown to getting, uh, well, uh, the, an IMAX theater, I won't say exactly where we are. Um, but in IMAX theater, where I got to see the, uh, where I got to see James Cameron's film Titanic, uh, which was quite neat to see it on that scale. Um, but also, I, I saw it when it came out, so I was like, uh, what, five uh, at the time? Probably, yeah. 
Yeah, I, there were scenes I probably shouldn't have been seeing, but uh, hey, <laughs> I tell you what, it uh, gave me a great frame of reference for, uh, no, for starting my research. And, get, and it kind of helped push my interest as well, um, because watching that movie, not only was I at that point fascinated with the Titanic before I'd even seen the film, but then also we get to see the wonderful workings of these model makers. And I tell you what, if you ever want to see a model working movie magic, that is the movie to, to watch. <laughs> oh, yeah. the I, I still hold up to this day that, I mean, what whatever you feel about the movie Titanic, special effects wise, that movie is a masterpiece. Absolutely. I could. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the one of my fondest memories is shortly after the movie came out. Uh, Paramount Studios uh, worked with, I mean, it was, it was like Paramount Universal Studios. They had um, an exhi uh, exhibition of all the movie artifacts, all the stuff that they made for the movie and so forth. It's kind of like Titanic the movie experience or something like that. Um, but it was really neat because uh, they basically had the entire bridge of the Titanic that you could walk through. So they oh, had all wow. the telemotors, the windows. Like It looked like you were looking out the ship. It was very, very cool to see all those props. Then yeah, then we got to see the you know the 1912 Renault touring car that was in the hold. I got to see that the one to one scaled model that they built. Um, probably my fondest memory though was getting to see that massive like I think it was like a 45 50 foot long model of the Titanic that they used for those wide wide panning shots and so forth. And it is just I I think that was the moment where I just I needed to build a model of this ship and I needed to study it very intimately i needed to understand all the reasons the whys and the why nots about it so I'd very say, cool kind of I, I, I understand you have an artifact from from the ship actually i i do uh in my very uh, meager collection of titanic related uh, memorabilia um is actually courtesy of my uncle uh Richard McKinney is part of the reason why I fell in love with Titanic and maritime history as it is. Uh, and he was kind enough to give this to me uh, a few years ago. This is, and I'll show you in just a second, it's actually a piece of anthracite coal, specifically from Wales in England. So this is coal that was mined in 1912 in England, was put aboard carts, was shipped to Southampton, was put aboard the Titanic, it deep in those coal uh, stokeholds and coal bunkers, and un actually ended up not being burnt. Uh, and sitting in that hold as the ship broke apart, massive amounts of coal came pouring out. That was part of, uh, part of the reason why we found the wreck of the Titanic is in 1985, they saw a wreck of a uh, trail of coal and kind of followed the coal to the wreck. So coal is, to this day, the only artifact that we normal peoples can legally own and possess. Um, but to be able to have even a tiny piece is, is very, very special. And I do want to show this little guy off here. Yep. As you can see, it is incredibly tiny. It's not very much to speak of. And honestly, I wish I had a better quality camera. I could show off the luster and the shine of it, but it's it's a very, very neat little piece. Now, anthracite coal is important. Now, when it comes to coal, there's a few different grades uh, of coal. Anthracite being the highest quality of coal that you can get. Uh, when you burn coal, uh, when you burn coal, you rate its its energy output, of course, in British thermal units (BTUs). Um, as you do with most anything temperature related. Now, when it comes to anthracite coal, especially Welsh anthracite coal, it's known to burn hotter for longer and release a larger caloric output, a larger release of energy, if you will, than any other type of coal found anywhere in the world. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So that was quite literally filled with the best coal it could get for generating. So, yeah, coal. they're. They're literally stuck in this thing with their with the steam engine grade of uh, base or equivalent of like racing fuel. Ex quite literally, uh, premium fuel, uh, and th and that's honestly what a lot of these big Atlantic liners uh, were trying to get to fill fill their holds. Uh, so, and it's not just Titanic; it's not just Olymp the Olympic class. You know, uh, the Cunard line wanted to get it for their big ships. They needed to have it for their express liners. Same with the White Star line. Same with the uh, Norddeutsche line. And every other major ship line, ocean liner, 
you know, that was ex expected to run express routes and carry mail and things that needed to get from point A to point B very quickly and efficiently. Now, another thing to, to point out, this is just kind of like a little engineering note, note as to why you want to use anthracite coal over other coals, is that it actually burns cleaner. And when I say that, I'm not talking about the emissions output. I'm not talking about clean coal. What I'm talking about is when it burns in your boilers, it actually does not leave as much clinker and as much uh, soot and as much crap that gets left over in a boiler. It doesn't leave as much behind. So you don't have to, if you're burning anthracite coal, you do not have to clean or service your shut down your boilers as often. Uh, you're burning a cleaner coal. You can, you don't have to take your ship in for maintenance as often. Uh, and you can run for longer. And that's great for that's great for these companies that are focused on the bottom line, the dollar, and their economy of operation. Yeah, so based on what you're saying there, so I mean, it burns hotter, it burns cleaner, so you can run your ship longer with less maintenance. That right there, that right, I mean, that's a big money saver. So yeah, no, no I mean, there's no joke why that stuff was uh, so popular. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's one of the best coals that you can get. And uh, I mean, we do see examples of what happens to boilers when the crews, the owners, the nations uh, in question can't acquire high quality coal. For instance, the German Navy in the First World War, they were all running on mostly reciprocating steam engines Ooh, and some turbines, me. but ultimately they needed to burn coal in boilers. Immediately after war was declared, they had only a certain stockpile of quality Welsh coal to burn. And after it was gone, that was it. So for the most part, they went around burning, you know, uh, I think it's bitumus and uh, there's there's another quality of coal in there too. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. But basically this lesser quality coal that leaves the more clinker, you ultimately dirties your boilers and has the side effect of producing a thicker, darker smoke. So you can more easily see a warship on the horizon that's using a poor quality coal versus a warship that's using anthracite or better quality coal it burns a much lighter wispy in fact this painting that i have behind me of the titanic it does a pretty good job kind of displaying uh what how anthracite coal burns it's it's a very light wisp that's then within a short distance of the ship it's just whipped away into nothingness and you can't really see it yeah First, i've seen a lot of a bitumus or, or or a bitumus and one of the other or any of the other qualities of coal it would have this just black belching it would yeah, look like a Russian aircraft carrier when they try to fire it up. <laughs> there's actually a really interesting, like, there's a lot of like stock footage I've seen of like you know ships from the like World War One, World War Two, and like you know ships on the horizon as they're going, and yeah, they just have these thick black yep. plumes of smoke coming out. So yeah, I mean it it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you see them coming on the horizon long before you ever see the ships. <laughs> yeah. Say, yeah, yeah. Ritz and Raygun says bitumous coal smokes a lot. Th that it really, really does. It absolutely does. Now, coal like that, um, in the United States especially, uh, I think they use that coal in factories, um, in some steam locomotives. Um, a lot of steam locomotives, actually, to be frank with you, uh, for the most part throughout the United States, we're using that quality of coal. But, I mean... Here, it's a bit different when you talk about a steam locomotive because that's on land and you can more regularly and easily pull it in for service versus a boiler on a steamship, which is deep within the bowels of this steel structure. Um, it's it's a much more complicated process. And another part of the reason why you want to be burning anthracite. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Fireplaces and stoves, absolutely. Fantastic. Ultimately, it's just the same concept, just scaled up to dramatic levels. Yep, absolutely. All right, so we've kind of gone over a little bit of a uh, some information on just like you know the fire in the coal bunker, the expansion joints, um, deliberately sunk possibly by the insurance companies. We've already kind of talked about that. The Olympic Exchange hypothesis. And I do want to point out one other yeah. thing about that insurance, just just before we move, uh, only because it, it, if if that was ultimately the goal to sink a ship for insurance purposes, it's so much easier just to light your ship on fire while it's tied up in port. I yeah. mean that that's that's 
on I, I can't tell you how many times in throughout maritime history that that kind of shit has happened that kind of stuff I'm sorry has happened and uh, suddenly we find a situation where um, a, a company is getting a, a very handsome payout and they're able to afford either buying another ship or starting construction on a, on a new one so it's you know but if, if you're going to do that you <laughs> you don't send your ship out into the Atlantic full of people that then is going to result in some terrible press you do something like that that's you know while it makes you look well it makes your crew look a little incompetent that they couldn't avoid that yeah. it also doesn't make as big of a splash uh, across the world's news but there you go that was the only other thing i wanted to talk about that insurance thing is that it's just eh. right i mean it seems oh, like right. there's a whole lot more subtle and less overt ways of doing it there are Absolutely. Yeah, Bar Barbara Vance does mention something here as soon as it pops up on my end. So, come on, where is it? So, yeah, Barbara Vance says, fraud is much easier, murder is messy. There you go. That's, yeah. <laughs> as we've found out through numerous trials we've covered, everything from the recent uh, Zachariah Anderson trial, I mean, the the crime scene in that case was a mess, even though we're I'm still absolutely beyond positive that he didn't do it and then i mean yeah the chandler halderson case that was nuts man i mean i'm not going to get into a whole thing there but that was a <laughs> uh that pretty much broke um, white star didn't it no i so the titanic and it's the titanic sinking in itself did not directly lead to the white star collapsing so this the white star story goes a little bit further uh than the titanic uh i would say what really did it in uh is during the first world war losing the britannic so within a very short window of time they've lost their two of their three largest ocean liners in the world that they've sunk a lot of money into uh with the titanic and britannic sunk it looked like they were going to have a rough patch after the first world war however what's important to note is the white star line was kind of able to kind of quickly recover um now one of the things to know about the first world war is that the allies got significantly more out of the versailles treaties uh than well frankly germany or any of the central powers ever would have uh, they got such wonderful things as these brand new ocean liners that Germany had started construction on uh, during the uh, run up to the First World War. And, and they tried to work on them a little bit during the First World War. But to be honest, what they needed was warships. So they basically these giant hulks of ocean liners sat on the stocks while the war raged. And then after the war, well, they've got these three and there's it's 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 actually i'm sorry there's four of these ocean liners that uh that they have under construction that the allies come in and take over and they divvy them out and they say well, okay well the united states contributed significantly and lost quite a number of ships so they get one which they uh, go on to rename the leviathan and becomes quite a significant piece of the american lines fleet um, and by the way, these three ships that I'm listing, uh, all of which are massive three-funneled ocean liners, and they all actually exceed the size of the Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic. In fact, what's important wow. to note, while Titanic was the biggest ship in the world in 1912, in less than a year, by 1913, that title would have been taken by the first of these three liners I'm talking about that Germany had under construction, which at the time was called the Imperator very fanciful and empowering name and in fact is to this day the last liner or passenger ship of any kind that had been built that had a um a figure on the prow of the ship it actually had a globe of the earth with a german wow. imperial eagle sitting atop it with its talons grasping the globe it's an imposing looking ship to be sure and she is about 930 940 feet long something like that i think she just laces about 50, a little over 50,000 tons. So she is a little bit longer, a little bit bigger than the Titanic and her sisters. Um, and so Titanic would have lost that, you know, uh, that trophy within less than a year. Um, but of these three liners that Germany was building, as I said, one went to America, one specifically went to the Cunard line. 
and was renamed the Berengaria to replace the Lusitania, which I'm sure some of us have probably heard that name. Passenger yep. liner was torpedoed by a German submarine U-20 off the Irish coast in 1915, um, with the loss of about 123 American lives too, which, as we know, kind of helped to gra- eventually spur America's entry into the war. But uh, so they got the uh, the that ship for that. Now the White Star Line, they actually got a little bit of a of a deal here, because just before the war they had lost Titanic, during the war they lost Britannic, and they also lost like four or five other major uh, ships of their fleet, smaller passenger liners and so forth. So they gave them two of the other, the other two liners under construction. The last one being this one of this trio, which became the Majestic, uh, which is a absolutely massive ship. Uh, that along with the Homeric, which was originally gonna be called the Columbus, uh, from what I remember uh, when the Germans were building it, uh, which was a slightly smaller two fond line, funneled ocean liner, but this was still like 700 and some feet long. It was still a pretty significant ocean liner. So, you know, the war ends. They have, by this point, like I said, lost Titanic and Britannic, as well as a few other ships, but then they gain these two significant liners in return. Now, the real death nail, I would say, to White Star. Um, Honestly, it, it came about in the 1930s. Now, during this time period, you do see the starts of the transition of passenger travel leaning a little bit away from ships starting to get into passenger travel, because at this point we're starting to see large aircraft, multiple piston engines, and uh, some of them starting to be able to make these crossings. Right. Um so we start to see, not to mention that, uh, we start to see the U.S. immigration codes change significantly. So there's no longer this massive influx of immigrants that are plying the trade across the Atlantic. Now what you see are a lot of tourists, as well as the well-to-do, um, so third class by this point after the war becomes tourist class, and they still have a first and a second class. Well, the thing about these big liners, including Titanic, is ultimately while they have these wonderful luxurious accommodations and these first class spaces they are made quite simply for the immigrant trade they are designed to bring people in mass from one continent or you know well actually yeah europe is one entire continent so from one continent to another i.e north america um so they're just giant people movers that's ultimately what we have to look at these like enormous greyhound buses that run on a set schedule across the ocean and brave any elements come what may yeah um real, real quick there um uh we do have a question from coming in from the chat so rosman ranch says was titanic thought to have ever been in the running for the blue ribbon obviously she didn't make it that far but was there hope quite frankly no none of the olympic class ever would have been um the cunard line pretty much had that sealed up back in 1907 when they launched the uh, Lusitania and the Mauritania. Um, these were these these two ships were part of the reason why the Titanic and her sisters were built. In fact, give me one second. I do want to actually show you what these things look like. Yeah, but they were designed, and in fact, around the turn of the century, eighteen ninety nine to nineteen hundred, the White Star Line took a drastic change. They went from building, kind of competing for the blue ribbon and, and competing for speed to instead building liners more for economy, they would be quick enough, you know, they would be just a few knots slower than the fastest, but they would be more luxurious, more comfortable. They'd be bigger ships. They, they would be more comfortable to be on in a severe Atlantic storm and so forth. That, and you know what? The paying traveling public would probably not mind an extra day or two on their travels if the ship they were on was in fact so comfortable. And this again comes into uh, where third class was traveling. They actually third class was treated remarkably well on the on White Star Line ships, but in particular, their accommodations on the Olympic class were worlds apart from anything they had seen before. I mean, everyone uh, the small like the, there was no longer these big open spaces where it seemed like you would keep cattle or something, where you had just bunks on bunks on bunks. Like if you've ever been on a, in a World War II battleship and you've seen bunk rooms. Imagine that, and you're expecting all these people to just sit in there. But instead, on the Olympic class ships, there were individual rooms. 
sure, you might be sharing rooms, you know, because there's a couple bunks in each of these third class rooms. You know, you might be sharing a room with a few people you didn't know, but you didn't have this giant open area where you, anyone could just come in and mess with your stuff. You, know, you knew the two or three other people you were in a room with. Um, but no, they were never in, in the in the running for the blue ribbon. Um, at this point, uh, the White Star Line was wanting to build ships that were more for economy. Uh, the Cunard Line had built Lusitania and Mauritania, which, sorry, I don't have these photos laid out more concisely. Get to. Here we go. Okay, let me go ahead and... Oh, give me the choice. There we go. Alrighty. Now, I, I, I'm just going to show one ship at the moment. Um, this is the Lusitania that I've got here. Uh, now, Lusitania and Mauritania were built and designed by two different shipyards. Uh, whereas Olympic and Titanic were built side by side by the ship, same shipyard. So what we can see is because this was designed and built by two different shipyards, there are actually some significant differences between the two ships. Um, but they are near enough within a 90th percentile identical on the outside because they follow the same blueprint. But these ships were designed as express liners. They were meant to dash across the North Atlantic as quickly as possible. Now, their regular service speed that they would be expected to run at is, a tw is about 24 knots. Um, now, these ships were capable of in excess of 26 knots, so they were very, very fast express liners. Uh, the Olympic and Titanic and even Britannic were not quite capable of this speed. Um, now, it's estimated that the highest possible speed that could be achieved by an Olympic class liner with all boilers lit to maximum pressure is about 23 and three quarters of a knot uh, 23 and three quarters knot um, so unfortunately it's just a shy bit under uh, the typical running speed even of the Lusitania and Mauritania uh, Titanic and Olympic mind you are going to be running around normally at a more economical speed of 21 knots um, just you didn't run your ships at full maximum maximum power all the time. You you usually ran them at about eighty five, you know, eighty to ninety percent power. Um, you know, unless there was a need for that speed, you typically like if you're trying to show off or say, for instance, win the blue ribbon. Right. Uh, the only the only reason uh, part of the reason why Titanic did speed up is that there was this little talk, or this rumored talk uh, between Jay Bruce Ismay and Captain Edward John Smith about how interesting it might be if the Titanic got in on Tuesday night instead of Wednesday when it was scheduled. Now, had Titanic maintained a constant high pressure, yeah, in theory, potentially, it could have got in just before midnight. But it's one of those things that uh, we'll never know. Um, unfortunately, uh, from what I can tell, it seems like the Olympics captains... Uh, didn't seem too interested in running the ship at the maximum possible speed. Admittedly, uh, North Atlantic is sometimes difficult to run in speed, and also it would probably be a bad image after the Titanic disaster to take your nearly identical ship and run it at maximum speed across the Atlantic. <laughs> kind of um, seems like uh, you're, you're being a little reckless, doesn't it? A little bit, a little bit, and, and you know, with hindsight being what it is. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, Titanic was never quite in the running and would never really be able to achieve that. Uh, a, Titanic was truly meant to be a much, just a much more comfortable and more stable ship. Uh, now here's the note, Titanic and Olympic and Britannic gets the advantage of that stability. Well, the Lusitania and the Mauritania are known that in rough seas, they tend to move around and roll quite a lot. And in fact, I do want to kind of show you this image of the Lusitania bow on, as it does give you a very good idea as to the sheerness the sharpness of the hull and how it, rather than simply moving waves, waves aside, it, it just kind of knifes its way through it. Okay. Let me see if it'll... There we go. Okay, there we are. Oh, yeah. So, yes, incredibly sharp lines, and if you can see, it kind of flares out a little bit. And that really is designed to help push that water away and allow the ship to, even under heavy weather, uh, turning into a gale, to be able to push your engines to maximum 
and even in those heavy Atlantic swells, still achieve her top speed. So she was very much designed for speed, and one of the reasons why she's known as the Greyhound of the Atlantic. Um, now, Lusitania and Mauritania, these were both like 785 and 790 foot vessels apiece, Mauritania being ever so slightly longer. Um, but, and, and being like, and I do mean barely half a knot faster. Um, but quite frankly, they were near enough identical and they would actually trade the blue ribbon back and forth with each, with each other throughout their lives. Um, but yeah, uh, unfortunately no blue ribbon, but, uh, a blue ribbon in terms of comfort, luxury, and service, I would say white star line definitely tried to uphold, uh, that aspect of their, uh, of the quality of their service because that was in the name. All right. Well, folks, we've been going for almost two hours, 15 minutes at this point. Let's say over 211 at this moment. So, wow, we let's say we I know we've got a lot more material that we can cover. But um, so, I mean, kind of getting back to the main thing is just kind of like, I mean, is there any other like major conspiracy theories or other like uh, just kind of myths about how she went down while she was affected? Weird coincidences. Anything we just we haven't covered yet? Well, it, it is interesting to note that there was a passenger aboard the Titanic that, oh, to some yes. degree, kind of predicted the disaster. Um, trying to find all my notes. glad glad you enjoy this the show, Rosman. Say so this, we actually have another show that we're planning to do closer to June that uh, he actually just told me about for the first time only about a week or two ago when we started first planning this one out. I'm excited for that one. That is going to be really, really interesting. You say you want to, you want to give a little teaser for that one? Well, uh, I, I don't want to give too much away, uh, but it we'll does. save it for the end of the show then. Yeah, let's save it for the end of the show. Let's let's save that for the end. Okay. Uh, well, let's make let's make our audience wait. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I, I do want to talk about uh, this gentleman in particular. Now, this gentleman, and some of you have probably heard this name, W. T. Stead or William Thompson Stead. He's known as the father of investigative journalism. Really? And yes. So uh, wow. in Victorian England in the 18, I think in the eight, I can't remember. Oh, goodness. It was in the 1880s. He became like early 1880s. He became the editor of the Pall Mall Gazette, which was a major publication in London, uh, talking about various topics and goings on. Um, very much equivalent to something like the New York Times or something like that in modern day. And he, uh, I do want to point out some interesting things. He was heavily uh, into spiritualism. Oh, yeah. And involved in uh, performing seances and studying uh, just communication with the dead. With the, yeah, it's, it's very interesting thing about him. But uh, what, what becomes really interesting is some of his publications. So in March of 1886, he uh, he's he, he at this point has made a name for himself of finding problems in society and digging his pen in as deep as possible until he can get results through changes in politics, through moving the people, the movers and shakers, so to speak, by the use of his press, by the use of his words. And oh. so in 18. Um, March 1886, he writes an article called uh, How the Mail Steamer Went Down in the Atlantic by a Survivor. So it tells the story of a passenger liner that went to sea with too few lifeboats, collided with another passenger ship, and started sinking very rapidly. Now, because, well, I, I suppose it, was, it wasn't too rapidly, but rapidly enough that they were trying to launch the lifeboats and get the lifeboats away. But there was a problem in that they rapidly ran out of lifeboat space. And so there were a number of people left on this ship that simply were on the ship and it sank out from under them. And it's from the survivor's point of view that's seeing these forms of 
survivors wriggling in the water, panicking, trying to stay afloat, and just very vividly describing the horror of the whole situation. Um, to these Victorian England readers who are just, you know, eating this up and, and just very concerned. And it starts to shift public opinion. In 1892, he publishes another article. A, I'm sorry, a, a, a short story. It's called From the Old World to the New. And this specifically deals with a white star line ocean liner, the RMS Majestic, not the one I'd actually just talked about previously, but the... Uh, the first Majestic, which was built in 1889, I believe it was. Um, actually, since we're talking about it, I do have an image or a good photo. Oh, you got a picture of it? I sure do. Fantastic. Let's see here. And a color photo at that. Wow. Nice. And I've got a lot of these. So this is the majestic. This is the uh, focus of the story that William T. Stead is, is writing about. Um, it was on an outbound voyage and actually encountered, in the story, it encountered survivors of a shipwreck. Um, again, a situation where their ship sank and there were too few lifeboats and very, very few people managed to, well, fewer than could have otherwise been saved, managed to survive. Um, and it both stories very much harken to this theme of not enough lifeboats on passenger ships and would often phrase that, you know, these events are going to transpire and happen. If not now, then in the near future, if ships continue to go to sea, few of boats or few of lifeboats, short of lifeboats, I'm sorry. Right. Um, and it's interesting because all his life, he, because of so many enemies that he had developed over his life, because he gets at problems in society, and that tends to make you enemies sometimes, he always said he's either going to die by lynching or by drowning. And so in April of 1912, he's invited by President William uh, Howard Taft to speak at Carnegie Hall at, at a peace congress. And uh, as such, purchases a White Star Line ticket and boards the only White Star Line liner that's leaving Southampton on that time, and that is the Titanic. And unfortunately, uh, Mr. Stead, just as he predicted, lost his life in a drowning. Well, we, we presume drowning. His body was never actually found, but you know, he lost his life in very much the same situation that he had been writing about for many years. And mind you, his first publication talking about this problem was 1886. So this is a long, long time. Wow. Yeah, so, so he almost kind of he, he almost kind of predicted his own way he was going to go. Very much so. And it's it, it, it's just another one of these like chilling details to the Titanic story. That just it makes you wonder. And from what we understand, his fellow spiritualists were as they tell us or they informed the press and so forth they were apparently contacted by his spirit oh wow yeah i don't know all the details regarding that 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 would pr probably be a, a separate video but yes just a, a very interesting note uh about one of the passengers in particular yeah barbara vance says that's creepy and sad yeah very much very much so uh yeah. And so there was one other thing I think I definitely wanted to get into before we close this out for the evening. And it was one thing that you had mentioned that I had never heard anything about this before. But there was the fourth funnel on the Titanic was a dummy and yeah. apparently had some secret... <sighs> Some secret stuff going on inside that I'd never heard of. Yes, and I actually do want to show you this diagram, uh, this, this profile of the plans of Titanic, because it'll best illustrate this. Um, share my screen with you. Now, let's see here. Okay, there we there go. We Let me pull that up. 
Now, the fourth funnel, as, as we know, the Titanic, uh, only the four, first three funnels were actually linked to boiler uptakes. Now, we can see right here yep. the forward two boiler rooms with uptakes leading to the first funnel. The boiler rooms four and three having uptakes leading to the second funnel. And then finally, boiler rooms two and one having uptakes leading to the third funnel. However, the fourth funnel serves a very unique set of purposes. When they designed this ship, they did realize that in an emergency in which the ship is sinking, the engineers are probably going to be remaining at their post for as long as they can. But then they need a way out of this immense maze of a ship and in a hurry. So they designed this really neat engineer passage shaft that went up a spiraling set of stairs that slowly worked its way up deck by deck up a shaft that led right to the base of the fourth funnel there was then another set of, of there was a ladder that went up the inside of the funnel to a platform that was all the way up here around the neck around this upper lip of the fourth funnel we actually have a have a photograph of the titanic in question Really? I think it's departing Queenstown, Ireland, where the tender's pulling away. And I can't remember if it's Father Francis Brown. It might have been. It probably was one of his photos where he snaps a photo of the stern of the Titanic as they're pulling away. And you can see on the very top lip of that fourth funnel the figure of a man as he's out there, presumably having a smoke or something, because that was just a place that they could go to, get open, fresh air, and they could go back down to their duty station. But it was also a really, really clever and well-engineered escape route for a lot of these men to escape. And actually, on the night of the sinking, some of the engineers that did escape were able to escape via this hatchway, or via huh. this escape route. Now, the fourth, fourth funnel also served an, an additional purpose in that uh, it served as an uptake uh, for the galleys, uh, for the galley f uh, uh, flues, sorry. Uh, so other stoves and so forth in the first and second and third class kitchens. Um, so that all had to go somewhere as well as the fireplace in the first class smoking room. So it all, in fact, if you look right here's the first class smoking room and it, that fireplace is going to be right about here. And it just vents directly up into, up that into the smokestack. Other interesting. interesting thing I did want to point out since we're talking about engineering aspects of the Titanic, uh, or, or, well, structural elements of it now in the film in the in the uh, james cameron film while the titanic is sinking uh, as well as some shots where we get to see the propellers in action it shows the central propeller of the titanic having four blades real quick before you get into that uh, you were going to show us a photo of the funnel yes uh of the of that exterior shot yes. yeah let me let's see that and then yeah we'll definitely want to get into because this is one you brought up to me and I had made a note about is, yeah, the central propeller. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, let's see here. I love when I can just search and one of the first photos I get is the one I'm looking for. Fantastic. Except it's not in a very good high quality. That's sad. Okay. <laughs> Give me two seconds. Sure. I'm going to go ahead and take this one off the screen for the moment. Absolutely. So yeah, Rosman Ranch says, I I never saw that photo. How cool. Googling. Linda, yeah, I'd never heard of this, the escape tunnel and whatnot. So yeah, we're I, I'm learning about this for the first time too because I had never heard any about the, anything about this. I didn't know any about this engineering stuff. But like I said, I knew when we start, when I started kind of laying the groundwork for this idea that I knew I needed to get this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you did. I, I really enjoyed this. I, I, I've even, even when, when going back and kind of watching some other stuff that I, I couldn't be, you know, uh, uh, involved with, such as on the Bermuda Triangle, I was like, man, this sounds like it'd be fun to sit in on. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm, I'm absolutely jazzed that I've been able to, uh, to participate and be a part of this. Um, now I've got the photo now, the quality, uh, it's not as a high of resolution as I would like, but you can actually see what I'm talking about. So let me share this with you. Okay. Uh, oops. Let's see. 
Whew. I am so sorry, folks. I'm yawning a lot. I, it's it's my sinuses. I'm a, I'm still got allergies, but yeah. So this is the famous photo, and actually, hold on, let me. Um, if it's from Wikipedia, sometimes Wikipedia does actually have the higher resolution images. Actually, I I did actually. Uh, so <laughs> it's not going to let me zoom in on it here. But okay. I actually did save a better resolution one, and I'm going to open okay. it up right this way. Sorry. No, you're fine. I'll go ahead and, uh, yeah, while you find that, I'm going to go ahead and take this down. Bear with me one second. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Oh, I see what happened. Okay. Almost kind of wish I had like the Jeopardy theme or something like that. Just kind of. <laughs> sorry, I didn't have. Quite no, you're funny. I you're fine. You're fine. I, I wasn't quite sure where all what all directions we might go in with this. So I'm like, ah, I have a lot of photos. Just. Not the exact specific ones I might actually need. <laughs> Stern here, okay. There we go. All right. Got it now. All right. And I'll present that. There we go. There we go. Bam. All righty. So we're going to zoom in on this photo of the Titanic. This is while she's sitting off the coast of Queenstown, Ireland. And if you can see, there's a little bump right here. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, now. Yeah, it's just so that's barely... a guy standing up there. That is a man standing up there looking out that platform. That is what that photo shows us. Huh. So this it's 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 really kind of a unique. Is in we, I've not found anything of the Olympic uh, that shows like this kind of angle. There are photos of the Olympic from the top side where they someone's gone up there and photographed the platform that you can stand on. Um, so that that's kind of cool. But but yeah, this is the only photo that we actually see where there's a man actually standing up there, and it's of course of Titanic on her fateful voyage. Wow. But yeah. This is actually one of the last photos taken there. The, the Fr Father Francis Brown did take a couple more photos as Titanic disappeared into the distance. But yeah, those just the very last time any the world at large really saw the ship until 1985. She disappeared into into history for a while. Into legend, practically. Really, it was. And I think that, if anything, is a good spot for us to. Oh, wait. We got two more things. I almost forgot. You wanted to talk about the central propeller. Oh, yes. No, no almost this is just forgot. something I, I wanted to touch upon since there seems to be this this confusion. Um, so, and uh, this is one of the books I, I kind of do recommend um, for anyone who's interested in, in uh, any sort of reading or literature on Titanic or the Olympic class ships. This is broadly appropriate. This is called The Olympic Class Ships, Olympic Titanic Britannic by Mark Chernsock. This is an excellent, and as you can see, it's, it's a good, thick little volume here, paperback. Um, and it kind of takes you through the his, kind of a little bit of the history of the White Star Line, uh, Hard Linded Wolf, some of the early liners that they've built, and then into the specifics of the reasons for the Olympic class, and then some of the specifics of each of the, of the three ships. Um, now, one of the important notes that Mark Chernside made, well, made while going through and doing some research for, these, for this book, as well as some others, um, was through the archived evidence and in, in like notebooks, engineering journals, and so forth that still exist within the archives of Harlan and Wolf. We were able to find engineering notes which specifically detailed some of the uh, design elements of hull number 400 and 401, i.e. Olympic and Titanic. 
And one of the specific notes is that while it does list in this chart Hull 400 having a four-bladed central propeller, it actually lists Hull number 401 as having a three-bladed central propeller. Now, there is precedence for this because White Star Line was always uh, experimenting with ships and just kind of trying to see what would work best. Um, and in fact, they had a few years prior, uh, like 1908, I think it was, they built a series of liners that was originally for a different company that White Star Line ended up, ended up acquiring. Uh, and Harlan and Wolf thought, well, you know, we're designing both these ships with the same plant. What if we alter one and just, just to test it out? What if we put a low pressure turbine in the middle and put a third propeller on it? Well, bam, suddenly we have a ship that actually turns out to be more economical to run and if needed can achieve a slightly higher speed. Um, so ultimately, when the Olympic class comes along just a few years later, they're like, hey, let's try this experiment. We've tried this, and now we're going to, like following the previous example, we're going to put a third low-pressure steam turbine engine driving a, a central propeller. Which one's going to be better, this four-bladed or this three-bladed? You know, we, you know, the more blades you have, the more blades there is to interact with the water as the blades pass each other. So in theory, three blades could be better. Um, but also you have to consider uh, harmonic resonances and so forth of the blades, like they can produce vibration. There's a lot of different things that go into it. Right. So it's funny to note that unfortunately, because the Titanic sank, they got no engineering feedback or anything about the performance of the ship. So when the Olympic came back from one of its voyages, they sent it to Belfast, swap, swapped out the four bladed propeller for a three bladed propeller to see just how it works because they didn't get to figure that out. Uh, and we actually have photos of Olympic with a three-bladed propeller when they switched it out, but they found that it did not perform as well. And so a few months or, yeah, several months later, they actually, yeah, Mark Chernside, uh, C-H-I-R-N-S-I-D-E. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, they ended up switching the Olympic back to a four-bladed propeller, and she kept that for the rest of her career until 1935 when she was scrapped, which I wanted to mention about those steam engines. Even in 1935, when they were pulling the hull of the tight, or, I'm sorry, the hull of the Olympic apart and scrapping it, those massive reciprocating steam engines were found to have been in as good condition as the day they were built. They were still great. They were still capable of running for many more years. And it's almost sad, <laughs> almost a shame, really, that these marvels of engineering were just scrapped. Uh, it would be neat to see just one or a piece of one left as a monument or a piece of uh of a museum dedicated to marine engineering but yeah uh, it's history for you it's, uh... i mean the only I, I think you told me one time we were talking about this like a couple of years ago and like i think you said that the only the the only existing example of the uh the reciprocating you know pistons that would work in those engines is lying at the bottom of the ocean at the wreck of the britannic well, and the Titanic. Let's and be the Titanic, they, they both, yeah. Oh, yeah, those are the only, the, to this day, the largest reciprocating steam engines in the world can still be found. It's just you got to either... You got to go a couple miles down. Or, uh, yeah, but they, that is where you'll find the biggest reciprocating engines ever. And they're just marvels of engineering, you know, the size of like a four-story house. They're... There was a... There's a really interesting video that I found a while back, and... I got to find it really quick, but it was a, a, there's a power generating station in England somewhere and they still use like a massive, and I think it's a triple expansion steam engine. Mm -hmm. This thing is, like you said, about four stories tall. Yeah. And you have to look at this thing and how big it is and remind yourself that Titanic, Britannic, and Olympic, theirs was bigger. And they had more cylinders. Usually what you yeah. see on land um, are usually like uh, two or three stage. Uh, so, you know, compound and uh, I mean, they're all compound engine, steam engines, but, you know, dual stage and then you have triple expansions, you know, steam engines. Uh, but usually they're not quite the same size as they're not required to have the same uh, output and they're not producing the same types of rotational energy or have the same ro rotational energy requirements that they're made to perform at. So but you, you, you're absolutely right though. These, these enormous things that you can see in buildings on land that are still, you know, still slowly revolving and you can still go and see them and, and just 
kind of get a sense of their massive scale. Oh, yeah. yeah this is uh, Kempton Park. So, yeah, you can. they're actually using a little pony motor so they can start the actual main engine. Oh, that's neat. Engine. Like... Apparently, this actually this is still running to this day. And, it. yeah, they kind of go through the whole process. There, we're getting the main flywheel started. And, yeah, this is a triple expansion steam engine, which, if I remember, Titanic was a triple or a Titanic quadruple? Was, so, Titanic was actually a triple expansion engine, but here's what's important. She had four cylinders. That's where a lot of people get tripped up. So it actually, uh, it, one of, and I kind of wish I had a diagram of the, uh, the engine pull up, but one of the central pistons, the smallest one was the high pressure piston. That's the first piston that the steam entered and did its work within. Then it moved to an intermediate stage pressure cylinder, which was immediately adjacent to it, which was the, the other centrally located piston. And then after it left that chamber, it then went to the two outermost pistons, which were the low pressure cylinders. But of course, after they finished their jobs within there, they were still at, I think, 19 pounds per square inch, something like that. So within the vacuum of those of the piping, the steam still had usable energy. So from there, it was diverted. What was left from those two sets of engines and the low pressure uh, pistons were then diverted to that low pressure steam turbine that drove the central propeller. And then after that, after it drove that central propeller, the steam still had power and was then sent to the little uh, that I mentioned earlier, the little steam engines that were powering the electrical generators back in the very aftmost portion of the ship. And then after that, and then what's cool to think about, these engines are closed circuits. So what happens that steam, after it goes through that, they then go to these massive condensers on either side of the ship, condense back into fresh water, and then they go back into the boilers and the cycle begins yep. again. The, the so again, for the audience out there, this is a pretty good example of what the inside of those engines aboard the Titanic would have looked like. Those pistons going up and down. And these now, are actually smaller than the ones that were put into those ships. I would say this is probably compared to what we would see on the Titanic and the Olympic. This is probably about a third of its size, maybe half to a third somewhere in there. It's, it's, it's a significant factor smaller. Now, what's interesting to know, if, if we look at the rotation uh, of the uh, flywheel there in that central drive shaft, now, you almost have to imagine that thing going at like five, six times that speed. Like if, 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 if you're spinning a propeller shaft at that low rate of RPM, if, if it's a twin screwed ship or even a single screw, you're probably slowly chopping along at maybe six or seven knots. Like you're moving yep. real, real slow. You're not moving very much water at all. So yeah, again, um, look, at the, look at the sheer size of this entire stack. All of this is one... Uh, another, you know, triple expansion steam generator system, just like the one you were seeing a second ago. When we're saying it, look, it's about four stories tall. I mean, it's legitimately like four stories tall. And like Harlock was just saying there, this is about maybe a third of the size of what was on board uh, the Titanic. That's just nuts. I am going to pull up a few images to show um, just to kind of give a little bit of a sense uh, of what these engines actually look like. And mind you, these photos I'm going to show you, these were taken before the engines were actually installed in the ship. So they're sitting in a massive warehouse with glass roof, natural light pouring in and so forth. Uh, it would be very different in the bowels of an, of an Olympic class ocean liner. Um, For sure. Let's see here. This is a this is a good one. Um, yeah, it's honestly that guy's kind of standing a little bit to the foreground. It, it it's maybe maybe about twice the size, maybe a little bit. It's very big, and I feel like the camera perspective, given that in this video that we're watching, the guy is standing right up at the very feet of it, versus this picture I'm looking at, the guy's standing like thirty feet away from it. Um, but let me show you this here. 
Oh, whenever you're done showing that video. I yeah, I, I could go ahead and pause it at any time. There we go. So this is looking Holy at, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. So yeah, this is kind of looking along the length of one of these two. And actually, if I remember correctly, this is, and I'm not sure if this is Olympics or Titanics. If I were to look, actually, I think this is Titanics because if we look at the drive shaft right here, it says 401. And usually you stamp sense. every piece with what ship it's intended to go for. So I believe this is actually Titanic's. Uh, and based on the placement of this piping to do, to send that low pressure steam out into the to the to the turbine, this is actually her port side reciprocating engine. Um, and, and in fact, the propeller shaft, it, it, the, where the camera is standing, would be smashed by a propeller shaft coming straight towards the camera position when this is installed in the ship but basically we're looking at it at a rear on view if you will um, but it does kind of give a good sense of the height of this and actually in this other photo we can see a man standing up here on um, kind of a scaffolding uh, kind of a walkway that's set up with uh, all this wood uh, and there's another gentleman over here as well and we can just kind of get a sense of these guys are you know an average six foot uh, so we can kind of compare them with the height of this immense thing from the very base plate up the height of these columns to the very heads of the cylinders. This thing is massive. And is truly capable of generating the kind of power that you would see powering a, a small city. I mean, these things were effectively small cities just afloat. Yeah. Gee, Manetli. Not to mention the 29 boilers, 24 of which were these giant double-ended uh, double scotch boilers with an additional five single-ended. It, it's just, it's remarkable the amount of steam pressure these things could develop. To be frank, I'm not sure of any ocean liners um, of its specific period that really match it. Uh, I know that later liners, when they kind of went away from reciprocating engines and straight to turbine, uh, to just constant turbine, uh, turbine engines, um, you do see ships that do creep up in their power outputs, especially when you get to like Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth of the Cunard line in the 1920s and 30s. But uh, for the period, there's just, there's nothing else that really generates the level of steam. Because there's quite frankly, not too many ships uh, at the, in the world at that time that uh, needed to move such vast bulk through the water. That is... That's incredible. I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Yeah. Well, folks, we've been going for, at, at this point, yeah, about two hours, 45, by the time we finish closing this out. I think that, uh, I think that we've, uh, pretty, uh, is like gone pretty hard into the, into this. I mean, this is, this has been a wild ride. <laughs> and, and I mean, I learned a lot that I didn't know about about this. So, yeah, I, I had a this this was a good stream. I, I really enjoyed this a lot. <laughs> I did too. This was fantastic. I I wish we could go longer. I actually still have more content, but you know what? Uh, we'll shelve that and pocket that for uh, something else in the future. Who knows? You know, we might have to do a part two. <laughs> I easily have enough content here, and I know I could come up with more content. So I would be very happy to do a part two. Uh, I suppose we'll uh, discuss that further and heck, see if, he, if that's what the people want. <laughs> well, we definitely got Barbara Vance's, uh, you know, accolade there. Great show, guys. Very interesting topic. Thanks. And Linda, this has been very interesting. Learned a lot. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, as always, thank you guys out there in the chat to say this is uh, this was one that we've had in the workings for quite a while. And I mean, it's it's definitely been one of those where there's been a lot of uh, talk about this topic. A lot of people have covered it, but I think this was a really cool opportunity to kind of condense a lot of it and learn a lot with everything. So I, I, I have to admit this is great. So yeah. Um, yeah. Rosman says great stream. I'll 
be back for the rewatch in the beginning. Thanks for the fun, Kaiser and Grand. And Shinny Graham Yell Rock says, I am too... And it's like, I too am loving it. Thank you so much. Can, is it, can you enter your guest speaker again, please? Yes, absolutely will do. <clears throat> so, folks, uh, this guy right here is a good friend of mine. Somebody that uh, we, we met on a job a couple of years ago, and you know, we, we shared a love of model building, and he kind of really drug me in with a lot of the maritime history that I just had never... I really didn't know anything about it. I've always been a bit more of an aviation buff, but I mean, he really drew me in. Well, we're talking about that too. Like I, I, yes. I, I, think, I think you definitely throttle up more on the aircraft and I throttle more up on the ships, but between the two of us, like I find aircraft fascinating. Absolutely. Really get to talking about that too. <laughs> well, one of these days we might have to talk about, uh, one of the most famous, uh, aircraft versus, uh, you know, versus maritime vessel, uh, instances ever put to, uh, history the bismarck ah yes oh believe me believe you me uh, because okay i have not only a passion for merchant ships and maritime history but also naval history i love studying naval history and warships and i have to say my favorite warship aesthetically and also story wise to study is hms hood pride battle cruiser pride of the royal navy uh, just a fantastic ship, really great looking. A shame they didn't complete the rest of the class, and she was a one-off. But uh, given that that is that the Bismarck story is so intertwined with the fate of the Hood, I I love that story. It's been one of my very first naval stories I ever studied, and I love revisiting it and expanding on it. So, yeah, you want to do a video on the Bismarck? Count me in because I could talk and talk about that ship and and the encounters leading up to it. And I think it would be a fantastic video. I've been giving some thought to doing kind of like a, like a maybe once a month or something like that, or maybe even twice a month, kind of doing a, another alternating show where we do like kind of like a history thing. And that would be the really Battle cool. of the Atlantic is just so fascinating, and especially the hunt for the Bismarck is a incredible yeah. story that I just, I don't know why there hasn't been a movie about it yet. There... So there has been, but it, not since the 1950s. Um, so it, there is, it's, <laughs> if you can go to YouTube, actually, and watch this. It's called uh, Sink the Bismarck, I think is, is the actual name of it. It's a black and white film, but it's actually really, really good and enjoyable. Another great, great look at early uh, model building and, film, and filmography and so forth. Very cool. Um, yeah. Barbara Brand says, "Now I need to go listen to Sabaton." <laughs> I did, their music video for for the Bismarck is very, very entertaining. Very also. impressive. Very impressive. That whenever they start the vocals up and the, about the ship screen. coming through the fog, that just gives me chills every time. Oh yes, oh yes, it very much reminds me of of uh, well the weather in the Denmark Street. That's pretty much how nearly every day seems. It's either stormy <laughs> weather or heavy fog or both. <laughs> Well, folks, if that if this uh, idea of doing like kind of a little bit of uh, so, you know, kind of semi semi, uh, you know, monthly or something like that or bi monthly or whatever history show kind of interests you, definitely drop a comment down there in the in the uh, comments below. Let us know, and then we'll uh, we'll see what we can work up because I know that he's got a lot of stories. I've got my share of like really cool aviation stories. I'm actually really planning on doing in a few, in a very near future episode doing some uh mystery like aviation mysteries of World War II and one of them so by two of my favorites from this topic well we have the three that my my I should say my top 3 we've already talked about one of them and that was flight 19 yes and we did that on the Bermuda Triangle episode. Um, the other two are there's a there was the the mysterious case, and this has been widely speculated. And I kind of wanted to dive into kind of looking into it because I have never heard of this story prior to this, and now it's fascinated me. There was supposedly a I think I believe it was a B seventeen bomber that she flew. On a bombing run, 
got separated from her bomber group. And at some point in the flight, the crew ditched. Somehow, apparently, according to internet history posts, and we'll take those with a giant grain of salt. I want to dig into this and get actual verification on this. But supposedly the plane landed in Brussels without a crew on board. I, yeah, it's Landing definitely a head scratcher. Landing gear down and everything, just touch down or okay. So now again, early landing. Like it actually landed, like landing gear and all, came in, approached, gear down, landed, taxied to a stop on the runway, and then they sent people out to go look at it and and. Yeah, they found there was nobody aboard. Wow. It's kind of known as the ghost bomber. Yeah, that's that would be new new to me. That's definitely one that uh, we should delve into. That, that, that's got me fascinated yeah. and hooked right there. <laughs> I, it's one of those, I've heard of this story, but I don't know anything more than just the very basics about it. I have never dug into the history on it. So I want to do that one, definitely. Okay. Dig into it and see what we got. One other one that is very weird from World War II that actually has a lot of substantiation behind it that is just too weird is the story of the lady be good. Okay. Not so she was the lady be good. The lady be good, she was a B24 liberator. She was she took off from base in uh I believe it was uh, Libya and she took off or maybe not Libya it was I think it was in somewhere in North Africa she was flying across the Mediterranean towards um, targets over I believe in Sicily I want to say okay I'm not entirely sure I gotta remember and so uh, she dropped her payload and turned around and came and you know started her approach back, but she took flak and was damaged, so she lagged behind her bomber group and was basically forced to just fly in their best direction that they knew. Now, despite the fact that their radios apparently worked and their locator beacons and everything else apparently worked, they overshot their landing strip. Well, on their return trip, they got lost because there was apparently some weather that blocked them from being able to see the runway. So they overflew the runway, and then they just they got lost. They thought they were still over the Mediterranean when they were actually apparently flying over the Gobi Desert or something, or not like the Sahara. That sounds. I was about to say the Gobi Desert. They're in China. Probably? Sorry, Gobi is is, is China. It's really Sahara. Is in, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, they they found themselves flying over the over the Sahara. Yeah, the Sahara. And they were forced to ditch because that they they thought their plane was basically it was it was basically flying on fumes at that point. Yeah. They ditched out of the plane, and then of the nine crewmen, eight survived the uh, the initial ditching. And the plane carried on for about another 70, I think, miles. And then, so they thought that they were still going in the, when they came, when they got down on the ground and they started looking around, they they thought that they were heading still in the direction of civilization. They were actually going further out into the desert. But they eventually happened upon the uh, the wreckage of their plane. And they managed to use it, you know, get a few supplies and things, and then they left it. I guess they, at that point, they realized how far they were off course, and it started going back the other way. But on the way, all eight of the uh, the crew eventually uh, succumbed to the desert and perished. Wow. Eight of the nine bodies have been recovered. The ninth one was never recovered. And the plane was actually missing and never actually found until 1958. She was actually found by a oil and gas survey crew that were flying out and doing pictures, and they reported seeing a plane crash 
on the belt on like on the uh on the sand dunes mm -hmm. and it was remarkably intact wow and so they reported it they noted it and then they flew back to base and no everybody just forgot about it until like i think in the 1960s so like a somewhere in the 60s or maybe even the 70s because yeah the the plane was eventually recovered I believe in somewhere around the late 70s, early 80s, it was recovered and brought back to a um, functioning air base. Like, it was actually the same air base it was originally trying to get to. Oh, that's funny. But what's even more in insane is that apparently a lot of, like, you know, this, uh, you know, they, they used a lot of basically parts. They took they took a lot of spare parts from the wreck and actually because it was in such a remarkable state of preservation they actually started to use parts from this B24 Liberator that had crashed almost like 40 years ago and just put them in other planes to replace parts that had gone bad every single one of those planes met with a horrible fate Oh wow, that's that is some funny. That's one wow. of the most famously weird. Is that there was a it was a passenger airliner that actually ended up with a armrest on the captain's chair from the Lady Be Good. The plane disappeared into the Mediterranean, was never seen again. The only piece, the only piece of wreckage that ever washed ashore from that was the armrest. That is insane. How did an armchair remain buoyant enough to... to well, was the arm rest off of the chair. Oh, the arm... Oh, okay, I see. Wow. Well, what the heck that was made of? But, yeah, that's insane. That's absolutely a crazy story there. It, again, it's one of those... It's like there, There's a lot of folklore around it, but, I mean, the lady be yeah. good. I mean, they did actually try to put parts in other planes, and all those planes crashed almost immediately wow. or caught fire or had some other kind of major incident major the lady be goods remains are still at this air base to this day wow yeah and because of the fact that it's in the middle of a desert there's no there's no degradation of the parts of course great and for planes. <laughs> i forget where but somewhere in Somewhere in the world, there is a monument to the Lady Be Good that is actually one of the p surviving propellers from the sh from the plane. A fitting tribute. Yeah. So Hopefully they don't put it a, in any planes. <laughs> yeah. No. But yeah, apparently. So there's that's that's one we're gonna cover one of these days. I got way off topic, but yeah. No, that's so. That's all. all right, folks, we're gonna go ahead and close this out here for real this time. Um. So, Bud, uh, you don't have your YouTube channel set up yet, but you are in the process of that, right? Yeah, well, honestly, it's something I probably intend to see underway here in the next few months. So, um, you know, I'll probably end up appearing here as a guest a few more times before I do have my YouTube uh, channel underway. But uh, in the future, uh, I, I will, of course, announce here. I'm sure I'll, I'll make plenty of announcements whenever that does get underway. Um, but yes, in the future, you can expect to be seeing uh, more often of me and eventually seeing me on my own channel whenever that eventually happens down the road. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm work to do before then, but we'll get <laughs> Yeah, we'll, get, we'll definitely get you there, that's for sure. <laughs> so, uh, is there anywhere on social media, like, do you have, like, Twitter or anything like that? I, I don't, don't actually. You know, it's unfortunate. I, I don't really have much in the way of social media be, beyond a, a Facebook, and I'm private on there, to be honest with you. Right. Um, no, but I shall set up some means of contact um, and, and set up uh, a separate email and so forth where people can actually contact me and ask questions and so forth. Um, unfortunately, I don't really have much social, but that will be another thing I'll be setting more up. I, I guess i got to become more social. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a it's a side effect of uh, of the YouTube life. <laughs> well, it's understandable. That's uh, it seems to be a real integral part of it. But no, for the moment, uh, I, unfortunately, I I don't really have a way to reach out. But uh, 
if uh, anyone wants to post further questions in chat or anything like that, uh, or of course reach out to you. Um, your questions can percolate their way to me and uh, yep. I can get back with people. Uh, you are on my Discord, I remember, right? That's right. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I am. Yeah, you did just I, I recently join my Discord. So if you're not already a part of, uh, of my Discord server, Kaiser's Pineapple Express Lounge, definitely go and hit the link in the uh, description there. There is also a link in the pinned comment, and that goes directly to my link tree. It should have the Discord link in it. It should be updated. I'm, I'm trying to remember to update that on the regular. But uh, if not, you know, just keep an eye out. Eventually, I will update that as well. But yeah, everything uh, there is easy to find. All right. Then you can easily find me there as, my, as I'm Grand Admiral Harlock on Discord as well. So uh, if you're in that, if you're in there, uh, uh, then you can easily find me as a participant in there and message me from uh, from Discord. So I look forward to seeing uh, you all in the future, and uh, hopefully, uh, look forward to hearing from some of you as well. Fantastic. So as far as uh, we got to get the uh, the final grift out of the way before we uh, you know go ahead and close things out for the night. So oh, did you what, did you want to mention uh, our upcoming video in? Uh, oh yes, topic? June. Yes. yes. So there is a future episode of Edge of Reality. We are going to be planning uh, about a very interesting maritime disaster that. I had never heard of until this guy told me about it. So you know what? Give give me the minute, the one minute elevator pitch for this. So, and I'm not going to give the name of the ship because I feel like that would spoil quite a lot. But we are going to be delving into an interesting, mm. dramatic, and tragic story of another ocean liner, uh, a considerably smaller ocean liner than Titanic. Uh, some of some people have known of uh, called it the Titanic of Australia, um, but we're going to be talking about an ocean liner that mysteriously vanished off the face of the earth with all 211 people aboard her just into thin air. It seems completely disappeared, never to be seen again, never to be seen or heard of again. After she left her final port of call and got steam underway and steamed off to the horizon. Only one other ship that met, that passed by it uh, ever reported seeing it. And then other than that, we've never seen or heard from the ship ever again. It they haven't even recovered a wreck ever either. either. We have never. And there have been even as fam famous people, uh, people as famous as Clive Cussler, uh, going out and trying to find the, uh, the wreck of this particular ship and coming up empty-handed. Many have tried and unfortunately repeatedly failed. So she's per, she's a particularly unique ship ship uh, in that she to this day has just not been found, and we still have no answers for the people aboard what happened to them. We can speculate, but we have no answers. But we will be diving into that on the next video. So, well, maybe we might be able to give some clues as yeah. to what happened to her. But all of we, that in the future. So. Um... Let me as like remind me that's coming up in June. Um, actually, hold on. Let me. Uh, I just want to check my calendar here. Yeah, because we're gonna actually time this episode to be right around the actual time of the wreck, and I believe it was June twenty eighth. Is the? I'm sorry. Uh, it's July. July. Okay. July, not June. I, I wanted to double check my calendar, but it's, it's actually July, not June. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we will definitely uh, aim for a date there in July for that episode, specifically for this ship. I intend to definitely have you on again before that. <laughs> By all means, uh, give me just a little bit of notice uh, ahead of time. Uh, but yeah, I'm more than happy to jump in and, and provide any commentary or contribution I can. Well, I definitely know that uh, another episode that we've got that definitely has got a maritime twist to it that uh, the audience has definitely been asking me for is the USS Eldridge, specifically the Philadelphia Experiment. Ah, yes, the Eldridge. Such a plucky little destroyer escort. You wouldn't <laughs> quite expecting uh, expect a ship like that to have such an interesting event surrounding it. But, uh, well... Big things can come in very small, small packages. packages. Yep. 
All right, so real quick, my little uh, short little grift here is going to be that uh, uh, th right now, so Friday, my uh, I, will, I am intending, intending on being with Mighty Meat over on his channel uh, for the Friday Lego build stream and just hang out and build stuff models and whatnot i'm still working on this saturn 5 i gotta get hauling on it i like to look forward to seeing the finished product man i'm excited i've got the first stage almost done nice. so yeah i'm definitely looking forward to that and then of course um that say so that's friday i don't have any particular plans for any streams over the weekend i usually don't stream on weekends but i have been known to jump in on any of mighty's if she's if he's available but then after that, we have Monday, the 17th, is going to be our next episode of the Palette Cleanser with uh, Kaiser and Meaty as we just do a, another random collection of uh, fun, silly, and otherwise goofy, uplifting stories from around the interwebs. And then next Wednesday, the 19th, I will be doing my next episode of Real Talk, where we go ahead and talk about uh, movies, film, and a lot of the uh, the cinema aspect of things. There's a lot of information coming out right now. I could almost do an entire episode of that show right now, which is why I'm almost thinking about making that one a weekly show. Uh, other than that, I don't know of anything. How uh, next Friday is going to shake, or the next? Yeah, the next Friday is going to pan out, which will be the 21st. I imagine I'm going to be on stream with Meaty, but I don't know because that is probably when I'm going to be getting my office redone and getting new floors put in. There's a lot of work going on here at the Kaiser House. Mm -hmm. So there may be some limited... I mean, so for the month of April, there might be a few uh, stream dates that get missed because we're going to be doing some renovation. I will try to update and whatnot, keep ahead of time schedule around things so we can still do shows if possible but uh yeah i just have to pardon our dust there on that otherwise that's everything we've got for tonight thank you again to my guest grand admiral harlock thank you so much for coming on bud this has been a joy and it's thank you to chat pleasure, thank you for having me yeah thank you to chat thank you to everybody that came out to watch the stream any of y'all out there on the replay crew hit that like button hit that subscribe button Come back and see us because we got more of this uh, content coming on down the pipe. We've got a lot of stuff that we want to cover. So, again, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys later, and we will play you out with uh, with uh, the edge of the edge of reality intro again. You ever wonder why we're here? You ever notice that the information that we're being fed doesn't always add up to the truth? You ever look? out your window at night when the rain's falling down you ever look down the street and wonder what is going on around you you ever look out at night and ask yourself is this all that i am where am i what am i is this all there is is this real life and as technology continues to bring us closer together it also tears us further apart we watch the skies and look at the planet around us and its natural beauty as it continues to march forward on and on and on, unending, unceasing, unwavering. And yet our world, everything that we've built crumbles around us. We wonder, is this it? Is there more? There's got to be. You know, we can search. We want to learn. We want to understand. We want to see all that we can see and know the, all that we can know. We want to look out there. We want to peek behind the veil. We want to ask the questions that nobody will answer. We want to light those fires, the sparks that ignite a curiosity in us. And we ask ourselves, what is out beyond all of that? Beyond 